Welcome to the Movie Planet Season 5, Episode 9. This week we're talking about 1992's Basic Instinct. With Joe. She is screwing with your head, Nick. Stay away from her. And Sam. He was a retired rock and roll star. A civic-minded, very respectable rock and roll star. Welcome to the Movie Planet. Joining me is the Catherine Trammell to my Nick Curran shooter. Yowza. Sam, how you doing, buddy? I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. How'd you enjoy this film this week? <laughs> Uh, you know, it was fun to look at some points. <laughs> it was definitely fun to look at. Um, you know, okay. I was expecting a great movie. This is, it's not what I got. You know, it's not a You bad, got a fantastic movie. It's not a, a fantastic looking cast member. This movie put the ass in fantastic. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, this week, I have nominated Basic Instinct from 1992 for the mystery thriller movie Pantheon. And after watching this week, I kind of wish I hadn't. On this show, <laughs> we'll be keeping track of all the movies worth your time in our Movie Planet Preserve, and the mystery thriller movie Pantheon is pretty skimpy, actually. Uh, at number one, The Usual Suspects from 1995 with a B plus. Number two, The Prestige, which you were on. You were on The Prestige podcast. Oh, yeah. That was also a B plus. And then number three, Gone Girl with a B. So... We have a femme fatale in this group, and the question is, can Catherine take out Rosamund Punk? Pike? Punk? Pike. <laughs> Pike. I think. Can she? She could. Her movie can't. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how this will go today. The higher the grade we give it, the longer it may stay there. Only a film with a higher grade can kick it out of its ass. So we will discuss it, analyze it, grade it, and see if it lands amongst the greats. But now that we've handled that business, let's get down to business. This week, we are talking about 1992's Basic Instinct, a movie made for $49 million that brought in $352.9 million worldwide. And we all know why. Oh, that ass. We all know why. It was that ass. Jesus. <laughs> Written by Joe Esterhaus, directed by Paul Verhoeven, Robocop's Paul Verhoeven. Music by Jerry Goldsmith, starring Michael Douglas as Detective Nick Curran. Sharon Stone as Catherine Trammell. George Zunza as Gus, the MVP of the movie. <laughs> Jeannie Triplehorn, the second Jeannie Triplehorn movie you and I have done. Yes. Dr. Beth Garner. Dennis Arndt as Lieutenant Walker. Leilani Sorrell as Roxy Hardy. <laughs> Her last name is Hardy. Name. <laughs> Roxy Hardy. Uh, oh, Rocco. Hard Rocks. Okay. St Stephen Tobolowski, a young Stephen Tobolowski as Dr. Lamont. Daniel Van Bargen as Lieutenant Nielsen. And Wayne Knight. Newman. As John Corelli, the man who gets an eyeful of Sharon Stone's snatch. Yeah. Yep. Now... <laughs> I know when, but do you remember seeing this for the first time, Sam? What'd you think? <laughs> um, I actually, up until uh, I watched this a couple days ago, I thought I had never seen this, which I technically have never seen this. I've only seen the interrogation scene, and what I forgot was the intro. Oh. I saw the intro. That's that's a pretty impressive part. <laughs> It's a very impressive part. Uh, so impressive yes. that it freaked me out. <laughs> and I didn't, I turned off the movie and I totally put it out of my brain. Find a happy place, find a happy place, find a happy place. That is an incredibly graphic and startling way to kill somebody and shoot that way. That's Paul Verhoeven, baby. Yeah. <laughs> That's, like it's, it's Starship Trooper is when the guy puts his hand on the wall and he throws a knife through it. It's RoboCop when he just they just destroy the guy beforehand. Yeah. It's disgusting. I remember seeing this in my teens several times. And that is all. <laughs> <laughs> I had an awesome time. <laughs> But now that we've handled that business, let's get down to business with our segment Inception of Perception where I dig shallowly into the internet to find out how this movie came to be. Don't get on the set, get ready to shoot, and then ask for rewrites. Studios do this crap all the time, and they wonder why they end up with a shit movie. Smoke and mirrors, guys. Welcome to the movie factory. Movie? You know, I hate the word movie. I don't make movies. I make films. 
The screenplay, written in the 1980s, prompted a bidding war until it was purchased by Carol Co. Pictures for U- for $3 million U.S. Esther House, who had been the creative source for several other blockbusters, including Flashdance and Jagged Edge, which are nothing like this movie, <laughs> <laughs> wrote the film in 13 days. That's about right. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Paul Verhoeven. Like $3 million. <laughs> Get me some bush. Verhoeven had suggested changes to the script that Esther House disagreed with, one of which included a lesbian sex scene that Esther House called exploitative. When Verhoeven unwilling to budge, Esther House and producer Erwin Winkler left the production. So they were like, no, Paul, we're going somewhere else. <laughs> Gary Gold- Yeah. Gary Goldman was subsequently hired to do four different rewrites of the script at the advice of Verhoeven. After the fourth rewrite, Verhoeven admitted his proposals were undramatic and really stupid. By the fifth draft, the script had reverted to Esther House's original with minor visual and dialogue changes. Joe Esther House received sole writing credit for the film. <laughs> they recycled it so much, it went back to back its original. To the- <laughs> Like I was go, I was like on board. It's like okay. So what was it like before? Um, <laughs> Wouldn't you like to see some of the settled other settled right back onto this? Like what the other scripts were that Bob was like. Oh, just go back to the original one. I think he just wanted to see the snatch. <laughs> That's he it. just wanted to see. He just wanted Catherine to be naked as much as possible in <laughs> as many positions as possible. Well. In preparation for the car chasing, Douglas, Michael Douglas, drove up the steps on Kearney Street in San Francisco for four nights by himself. Douglas recommended Kim Basinger for the role of Catherine Trammell, but Basinger declined. He also proposed Julia. Now, this was, she was, Kim Basinger was fresh off of Batman 89, wasn't she? I have to look her up. If you figure the movies are made like two years in advance or start two years in advance, 89 to 90 right there. That that been Kim Basinger. So she's riding a high right now as Vicky Vale. Oh, yeah. Okay. Do you know what else she did at that time? No. Okay. I wonder what she said no for this for. He also proposed Julia Roberts. Not my sweet Julia Roberts. She would never do this film. <laughs> she would never do this film. Greta Scacchi and Meg Ryan. Could you see Meg Ryan as Catherine? I... Was this pre-surgery? Uh, sure. Pre-surgery, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, so did Michelle Pfeiffer. She declined it also. Mm. She was doing Batman Returns. That would have been a good one. Yeah. Gina Davis was another one that was up for this. Kathleen Turner, Kelly Lynch, Ellen Barkin, and Mariel Hemingway. I wonder why so many women were up for this role, and yet said didn't no. happen. <laughs> said no. I wonder why. And I really wonder why... Sharon Stone said yes. Well, Verhoeven also considered Demi Moore, which I wouldn't have mind. Uh, Sharon Stone, who was eventually selected for the role, was a relative unknown until the success of this film, but had previously worked with Verhoeven on Total Recall. Uh, Okay, there it is. She was Quaid's wife in Total Recall. There it is. Verhoeven said her quick change of emotion before her part was killed in Total Recall prompted him to select her for the part. Quote, that transition for me was so notable, the evil in her eyes changes into the love of her life for, in a couple of seconds. End quote. She was paid $500,000. I want to I flip something. I want to smash something. Are you kidding me? Which is still more than Robert Downey Jr. got for Iron Man. He only got 250000 <laughs> A low sum relative to the film's production budget. Michael Douglas was determined to have another A-list actress starring in the movie with him. Oh, I wonder why. (laughs) He was too worried to take the risk on his own. Which tick could he put in his mouth? (laughs) He was quoted as saying, quote, I need someone to share the risks of this movie. I don't want to be up there all by myself. There's going to be a lot of shit flying around. (laughs) Is that a pun? Take some beans! Jesus. Filming in San Francisco was attended by gay and lesbian rights activists and demonstrators and San Francisco Police Department riot police were present at every location daily to deal with the crowds. Protesters outside of filming locations held signs that said, honk if you love the 49ers and honk if you love men. Those aren't really related. (laughs) (laughs) What if you accidentally gave two 
two honks. Well, <laughs> the protesters used lasers and whistles to interfere with the filming. Even though the police were on set and a restraining order was in place, producer Alan Marshall individually picked out each protester he wanted arrested. This disrupted production, leading to a citizen's arrest of Alan Marshall himself, which didn't lead to anything with the local police department. <laughs> wow. This is great. This is it, great stuff. Now, the famous scene. In one scene, Stone's vulva was filmed as she crossed her legs. Stone later said she believed the characters not wearing underwear would only be alluded to and not shown. She said she had been wearing white knickers until Verhoeven said they reflected light on the camera lens and asked her to take them off, assuring her that only shadow would be visible. Stone said that it was not until she saw the film in a screening room with a test audience that she became aware of it, leading her to slap Verhoeven in the face and leave the screening. However, Verhoeven denied her claim and said she was fully aware in advance that her vulva would be filmed. I'm going to go with Miss Stone on this one. I agree. <laughs> this might have been some hanky panky behind the scenes. is uh, pretty sleazy, and the rest of the movie shows the sleaze. Hail to the king, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and now a clip from our movie do you have a cigarette i don't smoke yes you do i quit congratulations thought you didn't have any cigarettes Oh, I found some in my pocket. Would you like one? I told you I quit. It won't last. You working on another book? Yes, I am. It must really be something, making stuff up all the time. Yeah, it teaches you to lie. How's that? You make stuff up. It has to be believable. It's called suspension of disbelief. I like that. Suspension of disbelief. What's your new book about? A detective. He falls for the wrong woman. What happens? She kills him. The film opens to a man and woman making passionate love reflected in a ceiling mirror. The woman straddles the man and moves her hips atop him. Her face is hidden by her long blonde hair. She reaches for a white silk scarf and ties each of her lover's wrists back to the headboard of the bed. As they both move and grind and arch their bodies towards sexual climax, her right hand extends back and she re reaches for... In ice pick, she repeatedly stabs him with the sharp, phallic-like device. The orgasmic frenzy of the kinky, erotic scene with sexual thrusting turns brutal, raw, and violent with multiple ice pick thrusts that cause gushing, spurting, and blood. And that took a drastic turn. <laughs> that uh, that escalated quickly. Yes. How'd you like that stabbing through the face that you see there? <sighs> Even, like, on my actual watch of this movie, it's it's still a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. For 1992, that looks really good. It looks really, <laughs> <laughs> really good. It's before CGI. I'm still just like, ah! Like, the dummy looks no, it's just like him. <laughs> mid, yeah, mid, mid, uh, this scene, I was like, oh, wait, I think I, oh, no, this is the one. <laughs> uh, yeah. Number one, I got to correct something, and this, this is a typo. It says passionate love. This is, quote, from the character. Yes, it is. Yes, it's she's just, not making love. She's just How did she get the ice pick there? And and he doesn't know? Yeah. I have no clue. Because yeah, usually, like, feet are moving, legs are moving, things are going around. Like, if I lose the controller in my <laughs> sheets, I have to throw the sheets off and whip them. She found the ice pick she that was it. hanging in there. Super. She just slid right in. Yeah, I don't know. It's just I've never there. questioned this before. I was like, there. well... It's Sharon Stone. She's got one. Mm -hmm. Maybe it, I, you know what? I'm not, <laughs> it's too early to get this dirty. Okay. <laughs> but there, here's the thing. There, there is a, there's an unrated cut of this and it's four more minutes added in and none of them are the sex scenes, but there's like there, I guess there's like one piece of it of this scene that was added in and it's when they pull back and you see her stabbing like 
three or four holes in his chest. Good, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. But you know what? I've got another confession to make. <laughs> and Sharon Stone can stab me in the face like that anytime. If that's the way I go, I'll go. I'm okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with it. Yes. Uh, the murder scene in San Francisco is investigated by a tough police detective named Nick Curran. The victim is Johnny Boz, a mid-60s retired rock star and owner of a nightclub down in the Fillmore. Time of death is estimated as being around 2 a.m. early that morning. The deceased left the club with his girlfriend about midnight, the last time anybody saw him. The bloody, naked corpse is still stretched out and tied on the bed. Crudely... But funnily, the detectives use special glasses and a laser light to view several cum stains on the sheets. He got off before he got off. <laughs> the <This> case. <laughs> an unnecessary amount of gum. <laughs> Very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> like he hosted an orgy the night before. Yes. <laughs> and st- didn't clean the sheets. Which is funny because the case... It's a Jackson Pollock painting. Mr. Boz was a major contributor to the mayor's campaign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and chairman of the board of the Palace of Fine Arts. Uncharacteristically, the police find several lines of white cocaine powder laid on a small mirror on the side table. Looks like some very, of the mayor. Some very respectable, civic-minded cocaine. Yes. <laughs> uh, already, Gus is my favorite character in the movie. Yeah, he's... He hits every single mark. There's a there's a line in this when they're like, well, what? It, we, there's a live-in maid. Well, she's five foot five and two hundred and forty pounds. No bruises on the body. Wasn't the maid. <laughs> 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 but everything Gus says, he is he is the audience in this. He is, and he's also because we'll get into it. Nick is so unlikable, at least for me, <laughs> that there has to be such a likable character in this. Yes. To compliment Nick's character. And for me watching it now, uh, does this guy ever do his laundry? Like, if you did that much damage to the bed, that day you're putting those sheets in the fucking washer. I mean, unless you still got a hormone monster going, sleep in it, pig. <laughs> <laughs> sleep in it, pig. You know you like it. Yes, you do. <laughs> I need some of those sounds out here. Yeah. Quick, we one off. Uh, <laughs> come on. <laughs> I'm sure there's a basic instinct quote in Big Mouth. It has to be. Yeah. It has to be. Boz's girlfriend is named Catherine Trammell, who lives at 162 Divisadero in the city. I don't know why the address matters. San Francisco detective Nick Kerr. Diviz, Kern- baby. What? Divisadero, Diviz. Oh, okay. Oh, that's right. You lived in I San Fran. Lived, I love... What was it like going back to your I old stopping grounds in this movie? I left my heart <laughs> in San Francisco. I love that city. Any movie just takes me right back. I was As I was watching, I was like, oh, I wonder if Sam is like sitting there playing the game of, I've been there, I've been there, I've been there, I've been there. Yeah. Actually, there's a scene on the wharf. It's across from the restaurant I used to bartend at. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Oh, great. This is like yeah, having a tour guide just, with us. Yeah, it was just like, boom. Okay, yeah, I've been on that staircase. Yeah, I've been where he drives. Yeah. I've walked that. <laughs> Jesus. Well, they film a lot in San Francisco. The Rock was in San Francisco. That was a cool movie, too. Yeah. Yeah, it Hell is. yeah, it was. In fact, there's... I've, I've t- never been to Alcatraz, though. Really? It, well, I left because of COVID. I couldn't... Well, yeah. I got kicked out because of COVID. Yeah. So... But you've been living there for a while before COVID, right? A year and a half, but, okay. you know, as a bar turns really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. I can imagine. But you know, you make plans and then COVID happens, you're like, oh, all those plans gone. Yeah. They closed down the, the rock. I think it's back <laughs> open now. San Fran Detective Nick Curran is ordered by Lieutenant Philip Walker to work the case. He and another detective, Gus Moran, ring the bell of Catherine Trammell's lav- lavish mansion home in San Fran to question her. However, they find only Roxy, Tramel's lesbian lover, is home. Roxy tells them Tramel is at her Stinson Beach beach house and mentions that she didn't do it. Kill Johnny Boz. Roxy is very mysterious, to say the least. <laughs> oh, yeah. I like Roxy. Now, I got, a, I got a question about Roxy later on here because, well, I'll get to it later on. Okay. Uh, this whole movie, I feel like every single woman in it is a femme fatale. Even Dr. Beth Garner no, yeah. is mysterious as Absolutely, shit. Absolutely, because there's points where you're like, oh, is she the killer? Right. Like, this is so 
film noir, yeah. it hurts. And they've added... Now, keep in mind, this is a very, very softcore porn movie, it feels like, watching. Yeah, the, and this is I'm in 2022. This is, <laughs> this is softcore porn. This is 2022. Imagine back in 1992 when this was in the theaters. This must have been like Deep Throat back then. No, I've, the first thing I asked you when I called was, how did this movie get in theaters? <laughs> and make $392.5 million worldwide. Oh, I know how it did that. <laughs> I know exactly how that happened. I don't know how it got in theaters. Yeah. <clears throat> well, the, the un, well, it was rated R. It was even rated NC-17. That's probably the best word of mouth anybody's <laughs> advertising anybody's ever performed. <laughs> Gus and Nick drive along the coastal shoreline on a winding road to Stinson Beach where they enter the driveway of the multi-million dollar deluxe beach house where two ultra-expensive sports, sports cars are parked in the driveway. The two detectives walk around the side of the house to a wooden oceanfront terrace perched above the spectacular bluffs and breakers. Holy shit, this house is amazing. Norcal, baby. That is amazing. That's a hell of it's a view. unbelievable. I could retire there and be fine for the next 50 years. That's why I'm <laughs> I'm trying to be rich. <laughs> there they find Miss Tremel, a gorgeous, classically blonde beauty, seated in a deck chair yeah. facing the water. Hot damn. Before they finish identifying themselves, God, she's fucking hot. She interrupts them with an, oh, fuck, she's gorgeous, <laughs> with an even voice. I know who you are. I know that that voice is turning me on. She already knows about the murder, but is inquisitive about how Boz died. Have we talked about how hot she is? She is gorgeous. Nick's fi- Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, Sorry, what are we talking about? Nick again? fills her in. We just talk about her <laughs> with an ice pick. Their questioning reveals her cold, icy, overtly sexual fast track lifestyle. Uh, Sharon Stone must have had a ball playing this role. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Number one, she's ten out of ten performance. Yes, I can't stress that enough. Um, even with her horrible lines. So would you say we're in a relationship? I was fucking him. <laughs> yeah, you can't tell if it's a dialogue or that that was written or a, is her acting. It's porn script. <clears throat> yeah, That's it's what not it good. Is. Yeah, it deserved four rewrites. <laughs> <laughs> just to go back. Um, yeah, like it's just you pro just grotesquely, distractingly sexual. Yes, um, but there is an oops, and I will point out. Ooh, what is it? They're heading up north. Yes, but they're driving. No, they're going... Di- no, no, the house is down south, yes? I don't know. Yes, the house is down south, but they're driving north up Big Sur, which is south of San Francisco. Okay, so... Geographically, they're wrong. Do they need... Like, I'm trying to think of that. I mean, there must have been a driving scene to get there. Yeah, so <clears> their <throat> their car was going up. It was yeah. going north because the coast was on the left. So okay. Going north from the coast. But they're going. They're supposed to be going south. Like if they wanted the shot, they could just film it like the other way. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't like when movies do that shit. When it's a real locale, yeah, get the shit right. Get it right. Especially if it's a road. You can't just write this in better. The other way. <laughs> the other way. I do like how she challenges these guys and keeps them a little uncomfortable. Oh, she is. She's a. She is. Oh, just the Muhammad Ali of this movie. Oh yeah. Just. Okay, name. Austin Danger Powers. Sex? No. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> she is the rope dope master of these fools. This is not her first rodeo. <laughs> no. <laughs> Which should worry both of these guys, and it worries Gus, and just... <laughs> and Nick. <laughs> Nick's guy like... Nick. Nick the dick. Yep, that is what he is. Yeah. Just a prick. From a busy corridor at police headquarters back in San Francisco, Nick walks into an open office door with a nameplate, Dr. Elizabeth Garner, counseling. The dark-haired police psychologist Beth is assigned to counsel Nick in this department as a recovering alcoholic and cocaine abuser. They are ex-lovers, and his personal life has been affected by their separation. He also hasn't had a drink in three months, and he doesn't use coke. In his treatment consultation, the troubled detective wants to be cleared. As he walks to the door to head out, she tells him, I still miss you, Nick, but he doesn't turn back to acknowledge her. Nick the dick. Nick the dick. Good God, man. You're banging your shrink. <laughs> yeah, sounds healthy. Yeah, yeah. Three months isn't a whole lot of time. No. When you're an ex-coke and alcohol abuser. And I'm thinking that it wasn't just that. It was that he shot some He shot some tourists. Yeah, he shot some tourists. Yeah. On accident, I think. How old do you think Nick is supposed to be in this movie? <sighs> How old is he supposed to be? I'm thinking Probably he's in his mid-40s. 
Oh, I was thinking he's in his mid forties in this movie. Oh, well, yeah, no, you're right. I'm thinking young because um, uh, Elizabeth Garner, her act, the act, what's the what's the actress's name? Jeannie Triplehorn. Yeah, Jeannie Triplehorn just looks so young, and this is I don't know why Michael Douglas is in this movie. I really don't. <laughs> he was this the only the one that said yes. Everybody else. <laughs> I'm sure every fucking actor wanted on this role. Wasn't this, no, because wasn't this around the time that it was leaked that Michael Douglas had a sex addiction? Then this would totally make fucking sense. Yes. Um, all the other women look way younger. I don't know who decided that Michael Douglas was a sex symbol. Michael Douglas did. <laughs> you could have gotten anybody else for this role. Keanu Reeves. He would, he would, he'd match the acting at least. Uh, Kurt Russell, maybe? <laughs> I can't even know something in the 90s. Anybody. Kevin Spacey. Spacey. George Clooney? <laughs> Gus even. Have Gus do Have it. Have Gus. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I, at this time, I believe, because I wrote it down later on, um, when they're at the club, I have the actual ages oh. of Michael Douglas and Sharon Stone in this movie. And it's rather surprising, actually. I'm pulling, I'm going down here to find it. Because um, I figured, like, he's a young cop, but didn't go so great. So it's been, like, 10 years, so. Michael Douglas was 48. Yeah. Sharon Stone was 34. God. 34 years old. Oh, fucking gorgeous. How, how old was uh, Triple Horn? I didn't check her out. See. Yeah. Board on the brutal ice pick murder includes gruesome details, no clues, and no solid leads in the case. 31 stab wounds to the neck and chest. Damn. No usable fingerprints, no forcible entry, nothing missing, no prints on the Kmart brand ice pick. The scarf is expensive Hermes and sells about 20000 a year worldwide. Boz inhaled the high-quality, high-content coked cane. Evidence was found on his lips and dick. And Mr. Boz left $5 million, no direct survivors, no criminal record. When this, sorry, when did this movie come out? 1992. Yeah, she was 29. God damn. She was the youngest person on the show. Yeah, that's what I was like. 20, like late 20s, early yeah. 30s. Uh, <laughs> like that's the way he's supposed to be, but right. Michael Doug's like, yeah, no, this is my role. <laughs> Catherine Dramello is the prime suspect, age 30, no priors, no convictions. Magnum come loud. Berkeley, 1983. I too hope to come loud. Okay, 1983. <laughs> oh, mall rats. Double major, literature and psychology. She's the daughter and sole survivor of Marvin and Elaine Trammell, who were killed in a boating accident in 1979. Hey, I was born in 79. Hey. She was the sole heir of all that cash. Estimated assets, $110 million. And formerly engaged to Manny Vasquez, deceased former middleweight contender who was killed in the ring in Atlantic City in 1984. Coincidentally, she writes thriller novels whose plots seem very close to real events. Her latest book describes a murder committed in a very similar way. Hmm. It's a red flag. And they're so, like, they roll up to this house. Nobody else is there. It's just her. And they go, she's got all that money. Like, His and her Picassos. <laughs> Hers is bigger. Hers is bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do love how they're so surprised with how much money she has. Like, she's been like, known. Yeah. Like, this she's is. hanging out with rock stars. Right. She's married to a box. Ex Manny yeah. Vasquez, Manny the boxer. Vasquez, the boxer. Did she yeah. kill Manny Vasquez? No, she got in the ring and got one hell of a right hook. <laughs> oh no, that's not Paul. Philip Walker says not unless she got in the ring, put some shoe polish all over her face, and de developed a hell of a right oh, hook. Yeah, he right. said that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Back in his apartment at night, Nick reads Catherine's latest pulp paperback, Love Hurts. He notes a section of the novel that parallels the crime being investigated and calls his partner. Page 67, cowboy. Do you know how she does the boyfriend? With an ice pick. In bed. His hands tied with a white silk scarf. I feel like Gus and Nick have this cowboy thing going on. He keeps calling him Hoss. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where Gus is from or how he ended up in San Francisco. Yeah. I really don't. It, the book is legitimately the entire crime. Is the crime. There's plenty of evidence to bring this broad in. <laughs> Nothing stopping this. Right. I'm sitting there going, what more do you need? Yeah. 
<laughs> in a conference room in police headquarters the next day, Dr. Beth Garner introduces Dr. Lamott, a teacher of the pathology of psychopathic behavior at Stanford and a member of the Justice Department's psychological profile team to explain the deviant behavior. Either the writer is guilty of premeditated murder or there is an obsessed copycat killer wishing to frame the writer. Wow. Stephen Tobolowsky looks young and still looks old. I think that's just how it, he stays. Did he ever have hair? I don't think so. I mean, this you're like a 30 years I mean, back. maybe in like elementary school and then just, that was it. I mean, you could argue he might be the best actor in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. But he reminds me at this time, this is when they kept, whenever they're doing cop movies, they always brought in the psychologist in to yeah. talk about things. Like in Die Hard with a Vengeance, they brought that ridiculous psychologist in and you're like, why is this Where guy is he? here? You're surrounded by detectives. <laughs> they got to have a... Psychologist. Right. The case's assistant district attorney, <laughs> John Corelli, believes the prime suspect, Catherine Trammell, hasn't got an alibi, but she hasn't got a motive either. He doesn't believe, except for writing the except fucking writing book. The book. <laughs> piece <laughs> by piece by piece. He doesn't believe questioning her would do any good. She'll just waltz in with some superstar lawyer who got, get us all canned for wasting the taxpayer's money. But Nick believes that she will not be a conventional suspect. I don't think she'll hide behind anybody. I don't think she's going to hide at all. He's trying to get deep inside that case. Yes, he is. Deep inside something. How did Wayne Newton turn his role in Seinfeld into roles in Jurassic Park and this movie? Because Wayne Newton is the fucking man. That guy's a magician. You ever Newman. seen the Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld between two bushes? Yes. He shows up. Yeah. He's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Wayne. Newton. Hey, Jerry. How are you? Good. <laughs> He's more, the uh, the host is more interested in Wayne right. than Seinfeld. It's, I, I remember when he showed up in Jurassic Park, because that was the first movie I saw. I didn't see this movie before Jurassic Park. Yeah, this is my first John, that was my first um, Wayne Newton movie too. Yeah. And I remember seeing that going, wow, why is Newman in this? And then when I saw this, I was like. <laughs> what else has this guy done? Jesus Christ. Is he an established actor? <laughs> He's in amazing movies. He's, He's in just, a lot of shit now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a bird's eye view of the beach house shows the detective's unmarked car pull into the driveway. Nick politely asked Catherine to come downtown and answer some questions. She accepts and asks to change into something more appropriate in her bedroom. <laughs> While the two detectives wait for her, Nick picks up an old newspaper on the coffee table, which he has conspicuously laid out with headlines and a photograph of himself. Cop cleared in tourist shooting. Red alert. <laughs> Danger. Will Robinson. Danger. Danger. I'm, I'm remembering the Lego Star Wars things that were on Disney Plus. And every time they talked about Anakin, you'd see some guy pop up in the back going, red flags, selling red flags. What? <laughs> I didn't know about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nick once killed some tourists under questionable circumstances and is considered prone to violence for killing innocent bystanders in the line of duty. Nick notices that the mirror of Catherine's half-open bedroom door reflects her stripping naked as she changes her clothes. He slowly walks closer for a better view. What? As she puts her white dress on without underwear. I just had a, an epiphany. Ah. Oh. This movie makes sense if you think of it like a porn. <laughs> This is this movie makes sense. It's not a porn spoof. It's just a porn. Okay. How's this for wrapping your mind around something? Is this the greatest mainstream porn? Yes. Or or it has to be. Or it's the only or <laughs> <laughs> the worst porn mainstream movie ever made. I've never watched a f mainstream porn movie from start to finish before, so this is the first one. Um, Sharon Stone just oozes sexy in this movie. It's like just have a podcast about this performance. She's just and her dripping as she walks, yeah, just oozes it. And uh, she's got new snippets in her little palace there of all of Nick's shit. Maybe we take him off the case. Yeah, at this point, I mean, it happens all the time throughout the movie, but I just want to hand him a shovel and just say, dude, just start fucking digging. <laughs> this is not hard. No, it's not. It's just, <laughs> this is not There's a, a lot idea. of puns here, guys. <laughs> 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 but when she, I mean, they have to know she's fucking around with them. They're detectives. It's a porn. <laughs> the film... Is oh no on the oceanfront drive to the police station as she sits behind the two detectives in the back and this is our actually our clip for this movie. 
Uh, Catherine lies about being out of cigarettes, predicts that Nick's abstention from cigarettes won't last, and admits to working on another book. I love that she asks for a cigarette, but's already got some on her. Oh yeah, she's fucking with his head. Power move. <laughs> yes, complete power move. And I love it when she's when Gus asks her how easy it is to lie. She goes, "Well, it's called suspension of disbelief." He goes, "Suspension of disbelief. disbelief. How about that?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, this is. So far, the only amazing thing about this movie is Catherine and her mind games oh. and her complete dominance over everyone thus far. They are all putty in her hands. Uh huh. And she's not, I feel like if they were running a race, she wouldn't even be breaking a sweat right now. No. And we're going to talk about sweat in this next scene when we see Wayne Newton because that guy is dripping. Uh, <laughs> For the boys. (laughs) For the the boys. (laughs) And the film is most famous for the following scene, one of the best in the film, the police interrogation scene. A video camera on a tripod is set up to record the proceedings. Trammell has waved her right to an attorney and is seated in a chair in front of a room full of male police detectives. Get it? She is poised, cool, and sits there in command of the situation, refusing to stop smoking, even though there's no smoking permitted in the building. She's matter-of-factly f- s- flirts and manipulatively toys with the libidos and sexual appetites of the men as she tersely reveals her past sexual activities with the victim and plays sex games with their minds. As predicted by Dr. Lamott, Stephen Tobolowski, she admits that she would have to be stupid to write about killings that later materialize. She confuses the police by associating representative fiction and actual truth. After admitting to cocaine use with Mr. Ba, she surprises the audience by directing a follow-up question toward Nick. Have you ever f***ed on cocaine, Nick? (laughs) Get him out of the room. She smiles and revealingly uncrosses her legs, flashing her pantyless private parts at him, and then she recrosses her legs in the opposite direction. The rest of the questioning is complete by Nick. They toy with each other and dig their eyes into each other. They have nothing else to say. (laughs) Five guys, one woman, and she owns all of them. (laughs) Yeah. It's, I, it's shot so well. It's done so well. I don't know how this scene came out of this movie. I, you know, I here, really don't. I feel like this is where they started the movie and then they wrote out from here. Yeah. Uh, Cause I'll be like Verhoeven. Uh, I pick on him in when we did Robocop and how he's gratuitous and all that, but the man knows how to work a camera because yeah. every time She's lying. That thing zooms up into her face real close, and you don't see a twitch no. on her face. Like, it's cold. Sharon Stone kills it. This woman is fucking scary. Like, we all know, the audience at this point, we all know she did it, and we're all almost, like, rooting her on at this point because they're all, everybody else is an idiot. They're complete morons. Yeah. and But I will say that this part of this downfall to the scene and the rest of the movie it's just the over the top sexual dialogue. It's just, <laughs> it's so unnecessary to me. I just don't, it's just, it's porn script. Yeah. It, it's, it's a, it's really over the top. I like simple places like butter in my ass, lollipops in my mouth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or switch them up. I don't yeah. Know. Huh. Whatever you want to do. What are you need to? Refusing to be bullied by any of the males, she voluntarily volunteers for a... That's what volunteer means. For a lie detector. <laughs> she voluntarily volunteers. I should have read this better. Uh, for a lie detector test, the polygraph examination is performed in a bare, windowless cubicle with an examiner. She has sensors placed on her fingertips and arms and belts strapped above and below her breasts. The polygraph operator bends over the machine and studies. We don't need to hear all this. But what we do know is that he comes out and he says, she ain't lying. There's no blips, no blood pressure variations, no pulse variants. She's either telling the truth or I've never seen anyone like her, which is exactly what happens in every lie detector scene in and, Hollywood history. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And then Nick being the macho man, I beat the test. Well, no, he says he knows people that have done it. But then he did. He admitted that he beat it. Well, he, he admits it later. Well, no, Qu- Catherine says that he beat it and he never admits to beating it. Oh yeah, because I caught that because he says I know people who've done it, and my thing is I'm sitting there going, is he admitting right now that he did? And if so, isn't the statute of limitations still a little on for him? Yeah, I mean, it's only been three, three months, months, man. 
not seven years. Nope. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's funny you say that because there's a lot of things that Catherine lies about in this movie that she sells so well you believe her truth. You really do. <laughs> you really do. Like, honestly, I didn't think she murdered anybody for nine, like 99% of the movie. Yeah. I didn't think it was her. <laughs> That's how good I'm she like, is. Well, I keep thinking to myself like, yeah, I'm like 99% of the time I'm on board with her, but there's that 1% of that where I'm like, oh shit. Could she? <laughs> <laughs> Nick offers to drive Catherine in her car. It's pouring that evening. He compliments her on her ability to fool the polygraph. When he stops the car in the front of her house, he seems perturbed by her omniscient interest in him. I would be too. Yep. <laughs> And then he heads yeah. straight for the bar. <laughs> Smart cop. Later that night, Curran goes to a bar with several of his coworkers. He resumes drinking after having been sober for three months. Not a whole lot of time. Not a whole lot of time. Officer Nielsen, an, internals, an internal affairs officer who has been a major source of problems for Nick throughout his career, shows up, and he and Curran get into an argument. Beth Garner arrives, and she and Nick then leave together. Hey, shooter! <laughs> This guy is what such a, a prick. prick. <laughs> like, who the Heck fuck? on the sauce again, shooter. Who the <laughs> fuck would do that in real life? Like, number the, one, if he's that guilty, he would have been guilty. But, like, what's going on, shooter? Double blackjack, huh? Just shooter. A couple shots tonight, <laughs> shooter. Man, stop riding me. <laughs> <laughs> he's so bad. He's so bad in this movie. But, like, Daniel Van Bargen, the guy that plays this the deal, said, I can't, I don't know of a role he's ever had where he isn't a dick. Some people are just born to be pricks. Beth comes to Nick's defense. What are the other guys doing? Yep. Are they so afraid of IA that they can't get up and say something to this dick? Probably not. I mean, they're all off hours. Still... Not these a whole are, lot of balls on the force. These are not friends, Nick. No. Except for Gus. He's pretty loyal. And Beth's going to take care of you. Yeah, well, he's going to take care of Beth right now. Back at Beth's apartment in her living room, Nick immediately forces himself on Beth, pinning her arms up on the wall, kissing her forcefully, and ripping her dress open in the front. In the misogynistic near-rape scene, he lustfully pushes her hands under her bra, scoops out her breasts, and kisses her even harder. Then he aggressively drapes her over the sofa as she protests, Nick, stop, no! He pulls off his own pants and animalistically enters her from behind, climaxing quickly. Am I going to be the only one that addresses this? But yes. That's just... That was not a borderline rape. That was a rape. That was a rape. That was a 100% rape. It was. It, but you know what? And the psychologist is okay with it. What? This is the dumbest psychologist. Like, I love her character in yeah. this, but she's the worst f***ing psychologist in, I've ever seen in film. It's She doesn't know better for some reason. She just It's like... She's a psychologist, but she's never done any psychiatry or psycho or some therapy on herself. And honestly, watching this whole scene for the 300th time, is that an aerobics class in the background? Yes, it is. It happens multiple times, <laughs> multiple scenes. <laughs> yeah. Because I, it, the whole thing is, her, her apartment's all in browns and dark colors. Uh -huh. And then against the window is this bright fucking pink. Yep. Aerobics and class. Latex and the whole thing. <laughs> it's hard spandex, not to. Whatever. My eyes were just drawn to that after I was like, They're, what are they doing over there? <laughs> I got to say, this is the first of many times I was so uncomfortable watching this. It was a rough for, scene to watch. For Jeannie. I am. Yeah, I can't believe. Look, I don't, I don't, want, I'm not the guy like, oh, jumping in because she's a woman and she needs to defend her. But like, this is an uncomfortable sex thing. There's a, a bunch of uncomfortable sex scenes throughout this movie where I'm like, is she really okay with this? I feel like if she had been taken by that creepy guy in Waterworld below deck, that's probably what it turned out to be. Yeah, we, this is what we saw. Yeah, but I also wonder how much of this was acting and how much Michael was Douglas real. Douglas being a fucking creep. And there are- I'm there, talking full titty and mouth. There, There's a lot going on. Yeah. There's a lot going on. A lot on of hands here. going places, a lot of mouths going things. Yeah. No. This this is a Iceberg, run ahead. We're in a danger zone yeah. with this one. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, the next morning, no, slightly later, they are lying together on their sides. Her torn dress is wound around her as they casually talk about Catherine Trammell. Beth is very upset at his crude and personal lovemaking. And soon after, Kurt, it's, and that was not lovemaking. And soon after, Curtly directs him to find his way out of her apartment. What I love is that Michael Douglas still has his pants around his ankles. <laughs> They're lying there. Yeah. Well, like, didn't kick that shit off. Like, they, like I'd be like, <laughs> it's finding me. I mean, he did rape her, so I don't know. He just was doing other things. But he pulled up his underwear. But not his pants. Oh, I didn't notice that. <laughs> now I'm following. <laughs> now I'm following. It's like, okay. Well, oh, yeah, we can't. No, I can't say we can't show Michael Douglas' dick because you see it in the movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, Spike some beans! Spike some beans! <laughs> um, yeah, how much, how, like, how much time do you think passed before they have this conversation on the floor? Because <laughs> it looks like it turns on a dime. Yeah, I, uh, I don't. It's so, uh, it doesn't. There's doesn't no flow fit. of time. There's no flow. There's no fit. It just rape floor. That's and it. this ad start, Jeannie Triplehorn being another femme fatale in this movie. Who knows? She, she's just as messed up as everybody else. Oh, yeah. The next morning in the bureau office, the tec- detectives have made phone calls over to Berkeley and have established that there was a murder in 1980, a professor in his bed, multiple stab wounds with an ice pick, and university records confirm that Catherine Trammell was a student there at the time. Walker orders this group to move on it and then instructs Nick to tail her. You see where she leads. Walker, <laughs> this is the wrong guy. Why would you trust Nick to do this job? <laughs> Porn. This is a porn movie. This is because because the guy who is there to fuck yeah. needs to be tailing the girl that needs to fuck. The next day, or that day, Catherine leaves her Stinson house, driving her black sports car into Marin County along the winding, twisting two-lane highway. Did I say that right, Marin County? Yeah, Marin County. That's right. Huh? It's also a Lotus. Oh, okay. Uh, Nick follows a safe distance back in an unmarked police car as she dangerously cuts in and out while passing cars at a very fast pace. We got a little chase scene here and at one point he slams on the brakes and sounds his horn around a blind curve skidding back into his own lane and just barely missing a large gray line to his bus frazzled he loses her but then locates her black car parked in front of a mill valley house uh yeah he's a bad cop he's a real bad tail too not good at it. he's right behind her he and and you know she's being a woman driver <laughs> <laughs> that's already tough enough to follow no, she's speeding along the the PCA, the Pacific Coast Highway. Yeah, and it, what, he's in a what, what car is that? A I, Chevy that he is. Yeah, I I know it's not catching up to a Lotus. No, <laughs> no. I mean, here's the thing. I do like the scene on the road. I think it's a cool road to do this scene on. Yeah, with all no twists and turns. Yeah, no, no, one percent. And for a mystery noir, this is a well edited car chase. It's not a believable one. No. No, not with those two cars. No, <laughs> pretty sure his car doesn't turn and like not it's on when rails. You're, tr- you're, <laughs> you're not okay, Nick. The term tail means you're supposed to follow them without them being noticed. Not actually try to be the tail to the donkey. Let me tell you something. You suspect. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise, motherfucker. <laughs> Nick parks a short distance away and walks over to a small plain house. He reaches into the mailbox and takes out an envelope addressed to Hazel Dobkins. Who the shit is this? By twilight, Catherine comes out of the house with an older aged woman, Hazel Dobkins. He continues to follow her car from a distance. That was not a distance. Through an intersection when she suddenly engages him in another chase. She guns her engine through a stoplight turning red. He's blocked by two other cars in front of him and is unable to pursue her any further. He drives through a Stinson Beach house where he locates her car already parked in the driveway, enters the gate in her outdoor heated swimming pool area. Steam rises from the water in the red light of an upstairs bedroom where the curtain... No one has curtains drawn in this whole movie. Uh, where the curtain is drawn open, Nick watches Catherine move all her clothes, caress herself, and then the light goes out and the room turns pitch black. And he still doesn't know he's being played. <laughs> no, he doesn't know the the entire time. It, No matter what, I, you'll never know. This movie really is an indictment on detectives in San Francisco. <laughs> 1992. <laughs> yeah. um, so Nick investigates Catherine. 
finds out all about this Hazel Dopkins lady. Uh, apparently, she had a prior arrest record, which revealed a homicide in 1956. Uh, Gus appears behind him to report his foundings from his investigation at Berkeley. Dead psychology professor Noah Goldstein. And guess what? He was her counselor. And Catherine wasn't even a suspect. Never even got a statement from her. And Gus is already aware of the notorious homicide case involving Dobkins, who was imprisoned for nine years for the crime. Nice little housewife, three little kids, nice husband, wasn't porking around, no financial problems. One day, out of the clear blue sky, she does them, all of them. Used a knife she got for a wedding present. Didn't even deny it. Sweet as honey, said she didn't even know why she done it. Gus Not knows a what's person going on. I would hang out with or should be out in public. Okay, and I can't even say this because we have been ragging on the writing in this movie, but this is actually really smart because they've give they've got everything on her except motive and yeah. evidence. Yeah. But everything else is laid out. Mm-hmm. And they keep throwing stuff out there. And I say this later on. It's like every time they introduce new information, it could go two ways. And you have no idea what to believe. Yeah. And maybe it's because Nick is such an idiot. He's such a fucking idiot. <laughs> Uh, suspicious but also intrigued by her dangerous personality, Nick visits Catherine's home again and is invited to go upstairs, but he pauses at her work table when he notices more newspaper clippings about him spread about. <laughs> Killer cop huh. to face police review. Tourist killed by cop. Cop cleared a tourist shooting and grand jury probe continues. The hell, man. With beguiling provocation, she turns and explains how he has become her next fictional protagonist. Red flags. Red flags here. No, this is like the Titanic painted red. <laughs> I'm using you for my detective in my book. You don't mind, do you? No, not at all, baby. <laughs> Smack her on the ass. Every time he's with Catherine, I feel like he's standing in the UFC octagon with a full-grown tiger. You are dead, man. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's the sheer power, control, and ferocity of this woman. She's hot? <laughs> <laughs> like... It's it's so stupid because you're like, oh, yeah, if I was Nick, I'd be doing the same damn thing. I would, too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at her using an ice pick. I wouldn't be trying to solve a case. No, no, no. no. I'd make sure she gets off. <laughs> a she calls him, she, she calls him Shooter and then Nikki, which was his, what his oh, wife used Nikki. to call him. Which is, how and does then she, she goes, yeah, I know. Right. Like... <laughs> <laughs> She really oh, smart. Man. She's so smart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, smart and pretty. She just taken an interest in me. <laughs> she likes me. <laughs> Their conversation ends abruptly when Roxy, wearing a black t-shirt, black leather jeans, and black boots, comes into the room. Catherine greets Roxy, her lesbian girlfriend. She flaunts her bisexuality in front of him by kissing Roxy, fondling her nipple, and then standing with her around, arm around her and asking, You two have met, haven't you? Oh my God. <laughs> As Nick strides out, obviously threatened by Catherine's sexual bond with a snarling woman, she promises, you're going to make a terrific character, Nick. <laughs> I was fine until he started making out. <laughs> like everything was like, you can have an overtly sexual, like fuck off man. Right. Like, she's my bitch. Right. But like when they just, <laughs> he's already gone <laughs> and it's just them making out and fondling each other. <laughs> The camera again, should have ended when he is left. This porn. <laughs> um, this is Paul Verhoeven. <laughs> Curran confronts Garner about Tramiel's knowledge of his private life. Garner felt compelled to give Nielsen his private file to enable Nielsen and other IA investigators to evaluate Curran directly. Curran attacks Nielsen in his office, accusing him of having showed his psychological profile to Tramiel. Nielsen screams back, you're through. You're through. She knows where I live and breathe. She's coming after me, Gus. Then stop. <laughs> then just Say it. stop. Just, just stop leaning into it, then. <laughs> stop. She, she's, it's, it's like one of those insect zappers. <laughs> like, I feel like this is a bug's All life. Oh, the light. Don't go toward the light. I can't stop I can't it. Stop. It's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> That night, at Nick, that night at Nick's apartment, Beth knocks on the door and then lets herself in with her own key, but Nick refuses to speak to her because he's drunk off his ass. Um, she basically tries to 
talk him down at the Nielsen deal. And then he sarcastically suggests a way for her to combat her hostility toward him through a different sexual relationship. Furious and hurt, she hurls herself at him, but he blocks her arm and then lets her go. She explains why she let Nielsen have his confidential file. He was going to recommend your discharge from the force. He didn't buy my value. If he didn't buy your evaluation, then why are you with the police department? He said, I wasn't objective, so I made a deal with him to review the session notes himself. I didn't think he'd show them to anybody. This scene reminds me of Doctor Strange when Strange yells at McAdams and says, you care so much. much. <laughs> like, I have a feeling that somewhere along the line, Benedict Cumberbatch remembered this scene in this movie when he did that part. <laughs> um, and Nick is slowly spinning down the drain. I, honestly, I couldn't give a shit less about him. He's such a fucking moron. He is. He's a horrible protagonist. But have you ever had that one friend that always does the the wrong thing? And you sit there going, Yeah. And maybe he, now? And he died. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I don't have the sound on here, but well, don't <laughs> I feel like a fucking asshole? <laughs> um, this is a slow burn with his descent. I mean... Is it though? I think it is because we see him at the very beginning of this thing and he's pretty lucid. And then with every single scene, he gets with Catherine Tamel. He becomes more and more unhinged. Yeah. I wouldn't say that's a slow spiral. He like goes and has a drink and then he gets wasted. We get, he has a drink and then he, he sexually assaults his ex-girlfriend. Rape. Yeah. And then now he's getting hammered drunk. Yeah. Oh, fought the IA guy. He smokes again. Yep. Um, with the TV blaring a B-grade horror film later that night, and I have no idea what movie that is. I think it's Pumpkinhead. Is it Pumpkinhead? I think it is. I think you're right. I think it is. A hungover Nick is awakened by the ringing of his phone. After receiving what appears to be a disturbing phone call, he drives to the scene of the crime. Lieutenant Nielsen is slumped over the steering wheel of a black car in an alley. He has been shot at close range in the head by a 38 caliber revolver. Walker asks for Nick's gun. He's considered a suspect in the killing after his temper tantrum in Nielsen's office. And as the penguin says, I got you! <laughs> I got you! So he's driving drunk to the scene, right? Yes. He's... <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> well, you know, Gus drives drunk too. I think just that's just yes. a cop thing. There are no laws. No, not for police officers. No. No. And uh, Nick is interrogated in the same room where Catherine sat. Weak in his own defense, he glumly admits that he has no evidence that Nielsen showed his psychiatric file to anyone. To a surprise, Beth defends him. I saw Detective Kern at his apartment about 10 o'clock last night. He was sober and lucid. I asked him in my capacity as his departmental therapist about his altercation with Lieutenant Nielsen. He expressed regret and displayed no hostility. Nobody talks like that. And then Nick uncrossed his legs, revealing his <laughs> pantyless for JJ and recrosses them. Break them beans! <laughs> <laughs> I, just, dude. He copies Catherine's defense, too. He copies it and... I like what? I mean, I, I understand she she's doing too much. How did Catherine know about his fight with Nielsen? I don't know. I'm. I'm. She's got people on the inside. She, obviously, obviously, it's like such a special case because he's required to go see her because he killed the people, and I'm sure because he got in that fight, it went straight to her because they're gonna talk about it. Yeah. Like at some point. I mean, this is before social media. You can't just look this shit up online. No. Pending the outcome of a psychiatric evaluation, Kern is ordered to go on leave. He catches up to Beth and sincerely thanks her for helping his case and apologizes for his mean words to her. Is Beth as fucked up as Nick is? She's worse. Okay. She's worse because she keeps coming back to him. Now, also, did you notice that when she walks away from him, her smile goes straight down to a serious face? Yeah, no, because she she's fucking, yeah. Is she a killer? No, I think she's just mentally just very broken. She's a broken woman. Like, I, I, if you had told That's me... okay with being raped. If you had told me at this point that she took care of Nielsen for him, I'd kind of believe it after oh, seeing no, that. Oh, no, I... Th honest to God, I thought she was the murderer. <laughs> I, honest to God, this entire movie yeah. thought she was the murderer or Roxy. But as soon as... Spoiler alert. Roxy died. Yes. 
I thought, oh, well, there goes my, so I married an axe murderer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> That'd be great, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The next they all keep dying. I don't know why. I don't know why. <laughs> the next day, as Nick packs up his things at the police headquarters, he's inquisitive about the accident which took lives of Catherine's parents. The results point to Catherine's guilt once again. Walker recommends that Nick stay in touch with Dr. Garner. It'll help on the evaluation. Walker might be the smartest person in this movie. Except for the fact that he put Nick on, on the her case. case. <laughs> yeah. Nick finds Catherine's black car outside his place, and she's sitting on the front stoop waiting for him, making a suggestive comment about his nickname. (laughs) She explains her sources of information came through her wealthy connections. Jesus. As he prepares drinks for them, he takes out a huge hunk of ice and begins breaking the chunk with an ice pick. She takes an experienced turn with the ice pick. He lights a cigarette for her and places it between her parted lips. Preferring not to be called shooter anymore, Catherine asks, how about if I call you Nicky? The name his wife used to call him. They toy with each other, not really knowing where they are going with it. <laughs> I don't think there's any way you can make ice picking an ice block sexy. No, no. It just doesn't work. No. And whenever the music kicks on, that's when it's danger time. Yeah. Jerry, I will say this. Jerry Goldsmith's soundtrack in this is really good. It really is. It, it complements this movie at every step. It is spooky. It is seductive. It is... It crescendos at the right points. <laughs> um, those some fun little girlfriend vibes they got going on there. Yeah. Are they a power couple? No. <laughs> it's like the sweet and the salty. <laughs> it's just, no. With her seductive, challenging style of confrontation, she presents him with one of her paperback books the first time. Fuck. A st- <laughs> A story about a boy who kills his parents. They have a plane. He makes it look like an accident to see if he could get away with it. As she leaves his place, she proposes that he follow her after midnight to Johnny's club. Gus advises his pal to stay away from her. Everybody she plays with dies, Hoss. Nick is an idiot. Nick is a fucking moron. (laughs) Because guess where he's going? To the club. Um, And I don't know about, I don't know how clubs looked in the 90s. But being that you and I have done a movie with a club in it, uh, The Matrix, wow, they changed from what they were in 1992. Yeah. I mean, all the lights are on. (laughs) It's a whole lot. It's very well lit. It's very well lit. Did you notice that the crowd's an older crowd? No, I did not. (laughs) Now that I'm thinking, sorry, this is the point where like Roxy is dancing so unerotically. (laughs) I'm just, just, I'm just fucking distracted. It's so aggressive. It, it's, it's rough to watch. And like, I'm conflicted because the club scene itself, I'm like, I would never be caught dead there. And when I see, when I see Michael Douglas walk in, he looks like someone's dad looking for their daughter. Yeah, it's it's weird. My, that's that's another point to my like. Why the fuck is Michael Douglas here? Why is he in this movie? So he, they go to the club. He's walking around looking for her. He sees Roxy. Roxy heads to the, the the toilet stall, and Catherine's in there, snorting coke. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Closes the stall door with her foot after Roxy straddles her. Can't they arrest her for drug use? It's Nick. <laughs> It's Nick we're talking about. Uh, Sharon Stone's dress is amazing. Uh, I fucking love San Francisco. <laughs> so much. <laughs> I love that city. Wait up, girls. I got a salami. I got a hide. <laughs> she's gorgeous in this scene also. Just, it, and yeah, that just the dress. Is, just, here, here's what's take away from this. <laughs> Sharon Stone. Maybe the most beautiful woman ever i know that she was voted people's sexiest person in that year oh my god had to be the decade might have been (laughs) like it was still it was either jesus yeah yeah um uh (laughs) i love this club scene (laughs) (laughs) it's very accurate (laughs) 
Uh, wearing a completely backless dress, Catherine first dances with Roxy and the black man as Nick watches and her sensual body movements and the way she kisses Roxy. With a beguiling look, Catherine turns. Okay, they start dancing with each other. They start making out on the floor. Sharon Stone was born to play this role. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there are certain times when she's dancing where I'm like, ooh, you're 34. <laughs> 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 it's okay. I feel about that with Roxy the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I get so another feeling about. Done, done. I get another feeling about Roxy later on. Oh, okay. The scene immediately transitions to the infamous, intimate, graphic, roughhouse sex scene between Nick and Catherine in the mansion for San Francisco. So here's what happens, everybody. They go at it. He goes down on her. She does her own little thing. She gets on top ties his hands to the board with the silk scarf and everybody in the audience goes, we've seen this. She did it. And then she leans back with her, her hand going back, reaching for something, but then throws herself on top of him and there's no ice pick. And you're like, I almost wish we didn't see the first scene. Yeah. And then it's, it's just weird. Why, <clears throat> why is she <laughs> reaching so it's not even like a smooth no thing. It's like she's really reaching for something and then just fucking slamming herself down. I and for those listening, when Joe describes the way the scene went, <laughs> it's exactly as he said. Yes. It it this is a porn. This is one of the scenes in the porn where they fuck. And uh I mean she digs his, her nails in his back. Like I'm wondering, did Michael Douglas actually have sex with this woman? I know genitalia touched. It there, I, there you see his dick. There is some Touch wiener. Her. <laughs> so she she digs her nails in his back. <laughs> yeah, it's aggressive and ferocious. And yes, I that that blood is going to permanently stain those sheets. Yeah, I, uh, I hate to lean into this anymore, but the way this scene is shot really does a good job of showing the power dynamic of Curran and her and her. He plays the whole I'm in charge thing. And all of a sudden she's on top. It's like, no dude, you no, are not, not in charge no, not, at never all. never been in charge. And if, if I was Nick and she took that silk scarf out, I would shit the bed. <laughs> Just, there'd be a mess I'd on be the like, bed. Nope. No, 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 no. Yep. Pineapples. Pineapple. <laughs> Pineapple. <laughs> uh, also, Nick gets a, taste of his own fucking medicine later yeah. about this. And no, it, it is so funny. She just totally belittles him. Yes. And I love it. It's like, motherfucker, you ain't shit. I was waiting for her to stab him. I hoped she, I, I <laughs> seriously, I hoped that she had stabbed him. Yeah. I was like, yes, no more Nick. Yes. He's an idiot. He's gone. Go. Gus will Bring solve. Gus. Gus will solve this. Yes. What if they had done that? This would have been such a better movie. Like if they killed off Michael Douglas an hour and five minutes into this and it was actually Gus's story. Yeah, because you see how easily the fly flies into the web of the spider. Oh, that and then amazing. the spider takes the fly. But then you see another bug that's like, oh, I've seen this multiple times. There's always a bigger fish. Yeah, that would have been a way better movie. Oh my God. Later, she's asleep next to him naked and he smokes a post-coital cigarette <laughs> he gets up and strolls butt naked into the bathroom when you can smoke in your own house there he runs the faucet cupping his hand to drink it into douse his face as he comes back up from the sink there is leather clad roxy fully dressed in the mirror behind him he's startled to encounter her she's expressionless but insanely jealous speaking to her man to man he boldly brags about his recent sexual conquest i think she's the fuck of the century <laughs> and there's the line of the century um apparently she just likes to watch I knew what you're into. When he says man to man, is he insinuating <laughs> that she has a wiener? No, he's just busting her balls. Because he called her Rocky also. Yeah, I love it. He's Yeah, that was a great bit. I That's what, I, like, I, I've, I've been watching this movie since 1996, 97, whenever I first saw it, and I am all but convinced she's got a wiener. Oh, no. She's just a... Okay. And that's the one thing Nick finally got right as a detective. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you give him too much credit. <laughs> and you find out her last name is Hardy. <laughs> that's funny. Roxy Hardy. Roxy Hardy. Nick hey, Rocco. I mean, 
he clearly had the time of his life. Yeah, he did. <laughs> Nick returns to the bedroom and slips into the bed next to Catherine. She kisses her hand and murmurs softly, Nicky. In the morning, sunshine floods the room as he jerks awake. <laughs> Great words. She has left a note on her side bed, the beach. Hurriedly drives to the Stinson Beach house. Walk. She left the house, got in her car, and went to her other house. That's fucking cold. <laughs> Fuck yeah, dude. Uh, this woman's in charge. Yeah, she is. He heard, okay, Roxy gives him a cold look as he passes and he follows Catherine to the edge of the rocky bluffs where a bonfire is burning in an open stone fireplace. She is wrapped in a white blanket. He kisses her and they begin talking about their violence-tinged night of lovemaking. He is totally intrigued by her and engaged in a dangerous game, underestimating her calculated amorality and destructiveness. Her exciting, clever mind games, coupled with physical sets, Sex released the pressures that have built up inside of him. A release fell that he couldn't open in sex with Beth. He admits that he's falling in love with her. Oh my God. Jesus, she's good. He is such a fucking moron. Number one, he's a moron for telling that he's already fallen in love with her. Yes. You don't. Guys out there, you don't do that. <laughs> don't fucking do that. Don't, don't be the schmuck. Don't be, don't be schmucky McSchmuck schmuck. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. Okay. <laughs> Don't ever tell a girl you love her. It's true what they say. Cops and women don't mix. It's like eating a spoonful of Drano. Sure, it'll clean you out. It'll leave you hollow inside. (laughs) Where the fuck is that from? The naked gun. Oh, my God. (laughs) Uh, Also, I'm so happy with her ego check. He goes, she's never seen something like this before. Get the fuck out of here. What you did... You know damn well what you did with her was fucking Disney compared to what she has done with Rocky. Rocky. Um, This is the moment where, and this is like, I really wonder how good of an actress Sharon Stone is because this is a moment, I saw it in her eyes. This is, she was looking at a toy that wasn't quite as shiny than when she first picked it up. Yep. It's there. It's there. She was born to play this part. It's like, I was shocked. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> she, she's totally sold this. I couldn't imagine Meg Ryan doing the same thing. No, no, no actress could have done this. I don't. Or Julia Roberts. Julia Rose would never do this movie. Don't you ever bring that angel in this. <laughs> um, maybe maybe the woman from Cruel Intentions? Sarah Michelle Geller? Maybe. But not as well. Yeah. Yeah, she, she just could. Be a different kind of evil. But yeah. now Sharon Stone is Oh, what about perfect. Gone Girl? I hate that bitch so much. She's not a, Okay. I'm not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Rosamund Pike from uh, the, the the other movie we were talking about the other day. Uh, Rosamund Pike. She was in, she, oh, what the fuck's the movie? Where she plays the person who, uh, with the nursing homes. No, yeah. You said Gone Girl. Different, different movie. No, it's the same girl, though. Same girl, yeah. Like I said, well, this is going to get cut out. Yeah. Yeah. She's not nearly fucking hot enough. Oh, I'm not going to cut that out. You're right. She's not Sharon no. Stone. She's not on a I level. Love, she's not Sharon Stone level. But also, it's just like, she's good at being a cold fucking bitch. Yes. Sharon Stone, she's going to make you fall in love with her. Sharon Stone is a and bear playing with a rabbit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just, just bat that bunny around. Bat it around a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> not going to hurt it until, oops. It's It's swingers. It's, you know, <laughs> you're a big bear, man. <laughs> Nick meets up with Gus in a country western bar. Gus is drunk and, and Gus hysterical. Gus is the fucking man. <laughs> and finally sobers up in a diner, angered and, con- he's not sober. He's not Angry- sober for shit. <laughs> he's drunk as hell getting in that car. Angered and concerned about his partner having sex with a possible murder suspect and the jeopardy he's putting himself in, the investigation has found that Nielsen was paid a large sum of money as a bribe, possibly by Catherine, to view Nick's file. I love how pissed off Gus is about Nick fucking Catherine. We need a Gus spinoff. You dumb (laughs) son of a bitch! You You fucked fucked her! Didn't you? How could you be so stupid? What's great is all the people in the restaurant looking back at him... (laughs) 
<laughs> like, dude, quiet down. And, yeah, but then this is Nick's fucking response. Dude, she's the fuck of the century. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> it. W- <laughs> like Gus drunk is a better detective than Nick is yes, sober. <laughs> yes, Gus is the man. We want more Gus. Um outside the diner, after he parts with Gus, Nick is followed by a black car. Suddenly the car speeds up, its lights go on, and it bores down on him as a target. <laughs> and he hurls himself above the car. He didn't hurl himself. He got hit by that car. Yeah, uh, sh- honestly, I think this is like Sharon Stone or Rocky. Like getting payback for like Michael Mc, Michael Douglas probably going way too far with those sex scenes. <laughs> he bounces off the hood and lands hard on the ground behind it. The car slams on its brakes, goes into reverse, and burns rubber straight back at him. He narrowly avoids being hit a second time. He jumps into his own car to pursue the black car as it speeds away. The black car finds itself in a dead end construction area, and there's no way out except back toward Nick's car. He plays chicken with the car, driving head on for it because he's bananas now. At the last moment, the black car swerves out of his way, goes out of control, makes a spectacular crash landing that Doctor Strange could have survived. It lands upside down. Nick turns over the driver, and it is Roxy. Nick. <laughs> Nicky, Nick, 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 Nick. I guess Roxy didn't like to watch that time. <laughs> You're not keeping up with that Lotus. Nope, not in that car. Also, I don't care how well you know San Francisco. There's no fucking way. That you got ahead of her. Nope. Especially driving up the stairs. I've walked those stairs. Yes. That car, the route he took, would have been destroyed. (laughs) It's not possible. Again, locales need to be accurate. (laughs) Holy crap. Yes. Uh, But, yep, here, here's the moment. There goes my soap. I married an axe murderer theory. Yep, there it is. I was like, oh, this is Rocky. This is Rocco. Rocky. <laughs> Roxy uh, Hardy. Yeah, Roxy Hardy. <laughs> she's in the background. She's killing everybody because she's so jealous. She never have her. The back and forth as per who you can trust in this movie and the framings that happen are deft enough that it keeps the audience glued to their seats. This is good suspense. Didn't yeah. know who was in the car. Yeah, I mean, I had an idea. When Nick got hit, he got some hair. <laughs> it was, went, honestly, I enjoyed every second. Of it. He went I, like 15 I, feet in the air. I hope it hurt him. <laughs> Honestly, after this movie, I'm never going to be able to look at Michael Douglas the same. No. Really, especially Ant-Man. Oh. Like, oh. I bet you have to... You're fucking your daughter, aren't you? Oh, no. Sweet Kate. My sweet Kate. No, not Kate. As Lieutenant Walker and other IA investigators and police extract the body and tow away the black car, Nick makes a statement describing the incident as an accident and then reveals that he knew her. Roxanne Hardy, last known address, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Who are you guys going to sell my file to now, he says, huh? Nick, this is not a way to make things better. His statement is awful. Awful. It's <laughs> fuck, It's a lot. Well, not as an awful, but it's a lie. Yes. He's lying. The IA agent thinking Nick is out of control orders him to appear in Dr. Garner's office at nine o'clock. She's not helping the situation. And that, who else knows this? Everybody has to be know. Everyone has to know they're fucking. Exactly. Everyone. So number one. You get them off the case because that makes no sense. <laughs> Number two, you get a new shrink because you don't fuck your shrink, especially your work shrink, because you don't fuck your work coworker. She should have been fired for this. Yeah, Ethically speaking, if everybody fired. knows it. Yes. In the police conference room the next day, Nick is asked to consult with Beth, Dr. Myron, and Dr. McElwain on a psychiatric evaluation. He is questioned about his difficulty controlling his temper by Dr. McElwain, and he is, and he, I think it's, I don't know if I can do this, and he makes a mockery of the psychological questioning before stalking out of the room. Beth hesitates and then follows Nick down the corridor, catching up with him. Nick no longer knows who to trust, since Beth is also able to manipulate people as a psychologist. Catherine must have one hypnotic pussy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, honestly, it's very, it's more believable in his statement. I, his statement is shit. <laughs> uh, he drives back to the beach house. The white car is parked in the driveway. The black car is mixing, missing, because that was Roxy's. Yeah. Roxy will no longer be a rival for Catherine's love. Everything is quiet and dark. Nick finds Catherine upstairs, sitting in a rocking chair that faces the window, looking out on the water. She's upset and haltingly describes her understanding of Roxy's motivation to kill him jealously. Oh, look. Catherine's vulnerable. 
Also, Here. by the way, fishy, 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 fishy. Also, by the way, can we say, I was really hoping that we were finally going to see Sharon Stone not hot as a crier. Yeah, nope. Nope, <laughs> don't sorry. get that either. Uh, so she's vulnerable. This allows Nick to play the savior and Which, feel needed. Every man's fantasy. She knows exactly oh, what yeah, she's she doing. Exactly. <laughs> she's like, oh, thank you, Roxy, for taking one for the team. I mean, <sighs> I just wish I knew her in reality. Don't we all? Like, knew her as in she lived in our world for real, not like I was friends with her. I wouldn't want to be friends with her. Oh, I'd be her little puppet boy. I mean, if she wanted to be friends, I'd be friends with her. <laughs> I've got strings. But, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be her Ultron. I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> after another round of sex in the beach house, which, by the way, this one's not filmed. Hey, a little hey, restraint. Look at that. Hey, you showed. They peacefully lie together in front of a roaring fire under the blanket. Nick suggests that Roxy killed Johnny because she was jealous of Johnny, too. Oh, she's just filling his head with all sorts of shit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Catherine dismisses the idea because Roxy, her lover, wouldn't set her up, and she never got jealous before. She got excited. Nick doesn't know why everyone around Catherine dies, and then Catherine casually talks about her days at Berkeley, confessing crucial information about her background. I don't have luck with women. There was this girl I met when I was in college. I slept with her once. She started following me around, take, taking my picture. She dyed her hair, copied my clothes. Lisa Oberman. She's setting up her alibi here. The web of deceit. It's so smooth. So, oh no, she's unbelievable. She is unfucking believable. I don't believe she's the killer until the last second. I could, I, I could actually say truthfully in my own head, this is the worst written script and the best written script. I completely agree. <laughs> The next morning in the police department in Cloverdale, Nick and Gus flip through police photos of the deceased Roxy as a young juvenile offender. I was hoping it would be a dude. And they view large color photographs of two murdered brothers that she had killed on impulse with a razor. There was no motive except jealousy. Gus sees a connection with the murders the paroled Hazel Dobkins committed and that both family killing females are associated with Catherine. Although Gus swears that Catherine is guilty by association, Nick defends her. Gus believe Nick defends her. Gus believes Nick's sexual passion has clouded his brain. Well, hell, she got that magnum cum laude pussy on her that done fried up your brain. <laughs> <laughs> and those are some graphic photos for a movie of this tone. <laughs> oh, wait, it's Paul Verhoeven. Yeah, it's Paul Verhoeven. <laughs> yeah, it's just... <laughs> I want a montage of everything Gus says. <laughs> just give me a Gus movie. Like... A miniseries? How stupid... How, f how far can your head be up your ass? If he hadn't died, it would have been a really good sequel, Gus going after her. Yeah, because he's the only one that doesn't fall for her bullshit. But did you see the sequel? No. <laughs> That's on HBO Max also. Because oh, yeah. I watched it after watching this. I was like, I remember it being bad. Is Michael Douglas in it? No. New cast, right? New cast. Yeah. Same thing. It takes, it's like 15 years later. Okay. Yeah. But she's in England. Sh Catherine. Yeah. Catherine's in England. Is it Sharon Stone? Yeah. And it's. Oh, shit. Oh, yeah. It's a piece of shit. Like, it, it I, it's nearly unwatchable. Landing no strike twice. Um, but Nick heads over fuck to. What does she do? <laughs> God. You look at the cover art? Fucking damn. Still hot? Just. <laughs> Just scrolling through the images. Nick heads over to you. Jesus. UC <laughs> can, we just, can we just talk about how hot? She's so hot. She's gorgeous. She's so fucking hot. Nick heads over to UC Berkeley. She makes me want to smoke cigarettes again. <laughs> My God. It's a trap. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> <laughs> Nick heads over to UC Berkeley in the office of the registrar to look at the school records for Lisa Oberman, but there was never a Lisa Oberman. Oh, Nick finds Catherine leaving with Hazel Dopkins in private. He cynically criticizes Catherine's befriending of psychopathic murderers. Catherine explains that she gets characters and ideas for her books from real life killers. Hazel is fucking creepy. It's because she's a psycho murderer and hasn't changed. No. They usually don't. <laughs> As in, they usually keep those little voices in their head. Before Catherine drives Hazel home in time to watch her favorite TV show, America's Most Wanted, 
Oh my God. Nick asks one more firm question. There was no Lisa Oberman when you were at Berkeley. Angered that he is checking up on her, she gives him another last name as she accelerates away. I said, Hoberman. Nick checks the police department's computer screen and accelerates or for a DMV license check on Lisa Hoberman. The words appear from left to right, 1987 renewal, Elizabeth Garner. Bum, bum, bum. Finkel is Einhorn. Einhorn is Finkel. Finkel's a man. <laughs> this is a really good twist. Yeah. This is the moment I was like, she's the perfect bad guy in suspect. Like, I would totally buy it at this point. Yeah, 100%. I I stick to my my story. I don't believe Catherine is the murderer the entire time. Well, no. The beginning, yes. I'm 99% sure she is, but God damn it, they keep throwing the 1% in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In Beth's apartment that same evening, Nick confronts her with his knowledge that there was an association between Catherine and Lisa Beth at Berkeley. Beth puts her own spin on the story, reversing the roles and downplaying her own bisexuality. This is so... <laughs> he... There are no more shenanigans, no more tomfoolery, no more, no more ballyhoo. <laughs> <laughs> this is so well done. Because uh, at this point, you don't trust any of these hoes. Right. It's insane. Like, you you truly don't trust anyone. Worst script, but best script. <laughs> Just, uh, also, can't explain it. <laughs> I'm sorry, but don't you think if she was not guilty, she would have shared that bit of information at the start? I mean. And gone, oh, yeah, she dyed her hair like me, and she did this and stalked me. I'm curious if it never came up because at that time in 1992, there was so some backlash against gay. gay and lesbian. There was backlash about that then. And so this might be something that they would have repressed and not brought up to their lovers. Yeah. But I would have also been like, Oh shit. I knew her in college. She's a psycho. That's it. Yeah. That's there. Yeah. When it gets back to his, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's... there's no reason this information should not have come up immediately. No. Nick's head is swimming. My head is swimming. I have no idea what that was going on anymore. Mm. Uh, Catherine scares him from behind when she puts her hand on his shoulder. He wants to quit playing games and explains how Lisa Hoberman told him the exact opposite story. She said, you got it backwards. She said, you even styled your hair like she did. Catherine adds another fact for the skeptical cop to assert her credibility. I had to go down to the campus police and file a report about her. I suppose you still think I kill people too, right? Jesus Christ. And that's when I grab her by the waist and go, baby, I'm still going to take you down. <laughs> In the campus police records room at Berkeley, Nick is told that the report about Lisa Hoberman dated 1980 was loaned out for the whole last year to Lieutenant Nielsen. On the pier, as Gus and Nick walk together by San Francisco Bay, Nick describes one possible scenario from the evidence. Beth's violent past, bisexuality, and secret deviant obsession with Catherine could explain her motivation. Gus can't understand why his friend staunchly defends Catherine, an obviously guilty girlfriend. Yeah, I've been on that wharf. Hey! Cool little note. You've stood where Gus was. I stood where Gus was. When Nick gets back to his place, Catherine had already let herself in and given him a large fern plant as a present. Gee, thanks. I decided to give you a second <laughs> chance. She purrs. I missed you. She moves in closely behind him, grabs his ass, and asks the second time if he missed her. With a determined goal to get him sexually aroused, she removes her top and reveals her right breasts in front of him, challenging him that because her book is almost done, he may not get to see her naked again. <laughs> The beaver offer you the fish. You take it the fish. Nick's a moron, but I would do everything Nick is doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is this is this you know is this a, a, a call to how dumb men are? I think so. And but and plays true. Like normally, I'd I, I'd fight against that, but but I'm okay with this dumb. Here's the thing: it's the dumb with Nick that I understand. It's the dumb with everybody else that doesn't make any sense. That's a problem. Yes, except for Gus. Except for Gus. Gus is the man. Gus knows Gus is the hero. Gus is. The way. The scene cuts to the two of them sitting in the window seat while sharing a cigarette naked. His back is to the wall. She leans against him. He has his legs around her. His next day's work is to do some research and to help him. She suggests a better, more realistic ending. Somebody has to die. <laughs> Red flags. Red flags. On his own, Nick drives to the small Salinas Medical Clinic in the Salinas Valley, about 100 miles south of San Francisco, and asks to see Dr. Joseph Garner, Beth's husband. Let's be honest, it's probably about 20 miles north of San Francisco with the way this movie's going. <laughs> <laughs> Nick is told that the doctor died about five to six years ago. 
He was shot while the local Monterey County Sheriff is spraying off his car. He tells Nick that Dr. Garner was the victim of a drive-by shooting as he walked home from work. The murder weapon was a 38 revolver that was unrecovered. Nielsen, no suspects, no motive, unsolved. The sheriff stopped spraying when asked, was his wife ever a suspect? He recalls that another San Francisco police detective about a year earlier had asked him the same exact question. His name was Nielsen. Although there was some talk that she had a girlfriend, Beth Garner was never considered a suspect. It never panned out. It's Beth. It's Beth. It's Beth. Beth did it. And that's the end. Nope. Nick returns to Catherine Stinson Beach House where he finds signs that she has finished her next novel titled Shooter. Oh, my God. (laughs) The printer is churning out pages and the artwork for the cover is completed. He reads a few phrases on the printed page before Catherine enters, and it's literally the end of the movie that he's reading. Nick has finished his research and she has finished her book. She coldly bids him goodbye. He can't believe what she is saying about the relationship being over and his frustrated anger bursts forth. Damn, she's cold. I know you need a heater in here because it's cold as ice. Dude, she is. Oh, I love it. She's so it's literally cool. I don't need to play with you anymore. Yeah, I got what I needed. It's almost a completely different character. Piss off. It must not have been the fuck of the century. Uh, on a street near the Bay Bridge. <laughs> it never was. It never was. <laughs> it was kind of a C-plus effort, actually. <laughs> okay, Gus drives up and excitedly tells a shattered Nick, Catherine Trammell's roommate freshman year. I just got a call from her. She's over in Oakland. Come on. I've been phoning people from her dorm all day. She must have heard I was trying to reach her. She says she knows all about Catherine and Lisa Hoberman. Here's something else. Johnny Boz, a psychiatrist, has an office on Van Ness. Guess who he shares an office space with? Dr. Elizabeth Garner. Gus knows. Gus knows. Gus knows. Gus is the way. When they arrive in Oakland, Gus starts off on his own because he's now stupid too. <laughs> he's, Okay. He starts off alone for the building where he's to meet Catherine Trammell's roommate in suite 405. He pushes the elevator button to the fourth floor, but the elevator stops at the second and third floor on its way. Out in the car while waiting for Gus, Nick realizes that his partner is in grave danger. He jumps out of the vehicle, runs into the building, pounds on the elevator button, but realizes they can't wait for it. He races up the stairs to the fourth floor, fourth floor. As Gus emerges from the elevator, when the door opens, he is savagely... No, take Nick! Bludgeoned. Take Nick, but not Gus! In the chest by an ice pick wielding hooded blonde figure covered in a raincoat. In desperation, Nick hurries to the floor, but he's too late. There's blood shooting out of his neck. (laughs) He's dying there with his legs sticking out of the floor of the elevator. Two things. Yes. Two questions. Number one. Uh, if you rode an elevator and it stopped at every single floor, would you get your gun out ready to go? I would. Something's off. I would. Number two. Yes. I tried to figure out what Nick saw to alert that he was in danger. I cannot figure it out what it is. I didn't figure that out either. Unless, of course, he was remembering the book. The book lines. Oh, that he got stabbed outside of an yes. elevator in the police coat. That's the That's only link I can think really of. really bad way to do that. Because it doesn't linger on the story long enough for the audience to fully grasp that. No, then they never mention it. Right. So, yeah, I... If he had said something or if he was looking over some stuff or he had a copy of the page and he was looking at it going, oh, shit, and then ran upstairs, I could buy that. But there just wasn't enough to tie that together. Yeah, and I feel if if, if he read it, like maybe that was the realization. It's like, oh, shit, this is how the book ends because he never really read the ending of the book. And if right. he read the end of the book, outside of psychiatrist's office, outside an elevator. Oh. Right. Yeah, there should have been some kind of tie in there. Or okay. wait, were they meeting in an apartment? Yeah. Because it was an office building. Or like maybe there was apartments, but the lights were office building. Maybe. All right, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. But God damn it, not Gus. Not Gus. Nick seizes guns, Gus's gun from his holster and rushes down the hall to find the assailant. A shadow appears on the wall. He spins around and yells, freeze. Beth moves forward. As Nick is screaming, put your fucking hands up and don't move. She calmly tells him, I got a message on my machine to meet Gus here. Where is he? 
He confronts her with more damning evidence as she moves forward, conspicuously holding something in her pocket. Thinking it's a gun, he fires, striking her in the chest. The impact propels her backward onto the floor. In a whisper, she dies. She murmurs, I love you. In her pocket is Bart Simpson. <laughs> Not a weapon this of any kind. Such a bad way. This makes no sense. The only thing that I can tie this to is that they, we've seen the Bart Simpson keychain several times through this movie. It made sense. And it's kind of large. <laughs> like extremely. Like it's, but why she's holding it like it's sticking out of her pocket, like like a gun, I have no idea. There's so many wrong things. Like it was okay when I thought that she was the killer. Yeah. And she was trying to like play it off because she wasn't expecting Michael to be there. So it made sense for her to be like, oh shit. Oh, this is not good. But even then, you have a very startled man. Who doesn't know gun, what the hell's going on? Who doesn't on. know what's going on with a gun pointed at you. You're not going to move and you're going to take your hands out of your pocket. And if I was in her shoes, the, the my last words would be, fuck you. <laughs> or burn in hell. Yeah. It's at this point, when he shoots her, I'm like, as soon as he shoots her, I thought, okay, she's not the killer. Because I never saw the weapon. And then when he pulls up the Simpsons thing, I was like, okay, it's got to be Tramel now. But they're not done fucking with their heads yet. No. Lieutenant Walker and other police and forensics experts converge on the bloody scene, finding a zombie-like Nick frozen with regret. A blonde wig, hooded raincoat, and bloody ice pick are found on the stair landing above the fourth floor. The raincoat has stenciled letters on the back, SFPD. Later that evening, the homicide team checks Beth Garner's apartment, finding a 38 revolver in the bookcase behind some books. In the kitchen, the detectives find two of Catherine Wolfe's paperbacks, The First Time and Love Hurts, and a collection of photos of Catherine with Johnny Boz and with her boxer husband. Lieutenant Walker concludes, I guess that's it. Nick looks further at the photos. There are more shots of Catherine and Beth in the class of 1983 Berkeley graduation. Now, this is really smart because anytime you've watched these movies, these mysteries before, whenever they find the killer, they always go back and they find all the evidence all of a sudden. This, if, if this was a traditional movie, it would have stopped right here and we go, Beth's the killer, we move on. That's it. But it continues. This is where it makes it 300 million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. This, is, this is the moment. This is the moment. Yeah, right here. Follow-up investigations reveal that the raincoat was Beth's size and she must have heard Nick and dumped the stuff on the stairway. There was no sweet 405 in the building and Catherine Trammell's roommate in her freshman year died of leukemia two years earlier. Nielsen's files are missing the Berkeley campus police report and any information about Salinas. The 38 found in Beth's apartment was the exact weapon used to kill Nielsen. The ice pick was the same brand and model as the Boz weapon. Both of Beth Garner's answering machines had no message from Gus on them. The tape on her apartment answering machine was unused. Johnny Boz's psychiatrist remembered that Dr. Garner and Boz met at a Christmas party at his house a year earlier. So in case you weren't fully aware that Beth did it, we've hammered it home. God damn, Catherine is good. Curran is congratulated so for his part good. in bringing down Dr. Garner. In his dark and quiet apartment, Nick is greeted by a voice. It's Catherine, who already knows about the murders. He is expressionless as she makes a feeble attempt to deny her feelings for him, but she can't hold back her emotions. The scene abruptly cuts to them making love in his bedroom. With tears in her eyes, they kiss each other, and she rolls on top of them. They do their whole thing again. As she climaxes, she reaches back and then suddenly comes down on top of him. Her whole body stretches across. He is motionless. Is he alive? Has he been pierced with an ice pick? Nope. He's fine. He lovingly reaches his arms around her. They lie next to each other in bed, both staring up. He's smoking a cigarette. She curls away from him toward the outer side of the bed. Catherine says, what do we do now, Nick? Nick says, we fuck like minks, raise rugrats. We live happily ever after. Her right arm reaches over the side of the bed as she retorts, I hate rugrats. So he revises his epitaph. We fuck like minks, forget the rugrats, live happily ever after. What a romantic. She half turns and twists around watching his watching him turn his body away to put out a cigarette. The music builds. Is she holding something in her hand? They look at each other for a long moment. She reaches out with her hand, pulling his neck and face toward her own body for another kiss. And the screen darkens for a moment and then returns. As Catherine and Nick kiss with more and more passion, the camera slowly descends down her side of the bed. When it lowers to the floor, the camera comes to rest with a close-up of the murder weapon, a thin steel-handled ice pick. 
What a nice little touch at the end. One yeah. final admission of her guilt. It was oh, the uh, <clears throat> the third time of the reaching for the ice pick yep. and slamming down. It really annoyed me. And then the whole another sip, it really annoyed me. But that ice pick reveal was perfect. That was awesome. Was perfect. <laughs> I only have one thing. Where is she going to put that after they're done? Butt plug? <laughs> I, I, you know, that's. I guess that's one way I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know. Uh, she's, got the, she's got the weapon right there. <laughs> At least it wasn't in the bed this time. True, true. But that's all, folks. Uh, according to the top critics at Rotten Tomatoes, it has a tomato meter rating of 41%, 9 fresh and 13 rotten. The critics on average gave this one a 5.2 out of 10. The critics' consensus said... Unevenly echoing the work of Alfred Hitchcock, Basic Instinct contains a star-making performance from Sharon Stone, but is ultimately undone by its problematic, overly lurid plot. It's pretty fair. Yeah, pretty fair. Let's take a look and see what those critics said about this one from the rotten side. Kenneth Turin of the Los Angeles Times said, quote, Basic Instinct is a reminder of the difference between exhilaration and exhaustion, between tension and hysteria, between eroticism and exhibitionism. The line may be fine, but it is a real enough to separate the great thrillers from the also-rans. That's a pretty good thriller, though. I thought it was okay. I, in fact, whenever I've described this movie to people, I always say, if you took the sex out of this, it's still a good movie. Yeah. You just don't need the sex at all. No. Except for the first, the first scene you the need that. The first scene you need that because yeah. that sets everything up. Uh, Carrie Ricky of the Philadelphia Inquirer said, "Call quote, call me a prude, but it's not sexy watching an erotic thriller in which every time a couple does it, one of them gets it with an ice pick. I don't care how many firmly toned tummies and tushies are bared. <laughs> it only happened once. And Roger Ebert says, quote, the film is like a crossword puzzle. It keeps your interest until you solve it. Then it's just a worthless scrap with the scrap basis filled in. I don't know if I agree with that. That was harsh, Roger. I, I mean, I I enjoyed my time I, looking at Sharon Stone. I, the audience score was a 4.4 out of 5. That is way too fucking high. 91% <laughs> agreeing it's a 3 or higher. <laughs> Jesus Christ. A lot of 13-year-olds that graded that one. Yeah, for real. But the movie's over. Were you entertained? And I'm going to say absolutely. <laughs> I'm glad you felt that way. Because, because <laughs> my mine is it was. I was. <laughs> it was. It's okay. It's okay. Let's figure out the words got it right. Okay, at the Academy Awards, it was nominated for two awards. Best film editing, which went to Unforgiven. That's weird. And uh Best Music. But Aladdin won that year. Yeah, you're out of luck there. I mean, you're not beating Aladdin on that. <laughs> no. One. Uh, Golden Globes was nominated for a couple of awards there. Best performance by an actress. 100%. But Emma Thompson won for what is, Howard's End. What is Howard's End? I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, and then Best Original Score went to Aladdin again, instead of Basic Instinct, yeah. which it, it, it'll end. Yeah. But I don't know. Sharon. Sharon Stone, people remember Sharon Stone still 30 years later for this role. Oh, yeah. No, She's only known for this role, really. Never goes away. Yeah. Uh, at the Saturn Awards, five nominations, zero wins. Uh, best actress went to Virginia Madsen for Candyman. Fuck. <laughs> but, lo but look at the year this was. Meryl Streep, Death Becomes Her, not love that movie Rebecca De Mornay, The Hand That Rocks the Cradle Jesus another femme fatale Sharon Stone a Cheryl Lee for Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me yeah. Sigourney Weaver for Alien Cubed <laughs> wow and, and Winona Ryder for Dracula uh, best director went to Francis Ford Coppola for Dr Dra uh, Dracula have you watched Dracula recently the Coppola version? Yeah. Yes. It's a hard watch. It's a really hard watch. Once you get past the first 20 minutes, you're like, that's all I really want to see. <laughs> it's brutal. Yeah. Uh, I believe that's also another movie with our girl, Monica Bellucci. Bellucci. She was the Merovingian's uh, wife, Persephone. Yes, she was. Yes. Uh, best horror film. It was not her best horror film. Lost to Dracula. 
I wouldn't say this is a horror film. No. <laughs> uh, it was nominated for Best Music, but Twin Peaks won. Interesting. Over Aladdin? I, I wouldn't. I love Twin Peaks. I love Twin Peaks. But Over Beauty and the Beast? Music? Well, no, that's what I'm saying. The music, though, like, that's really weird out there, David Lynch kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah. Beauty and the Beast and Ale- Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin came out in the same fucking year. <laughs> Did they? I don't know if they came out the same year. This might have been something where it was just overlapping in the awards season for Saturn Awards. Jesus. Yeah. And uh, best writing. It was nominated for best writing, but Dracula won again. And for that, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> didn't get best acting because whoa, Dracula, dude. <laughs> Um, but then you consider what it was up against. Alien 3, which <laughs> didn't really have a script at all while I was filming. Nope. Basic Instinct, the best worst script ever. Candyman. What would that, with the Not fifth a- the fifth tier horror film? Yeah. Yeah. Death Becomes Her. I love that movie so much. That's your weekend at Bernie's, isn't it? It really is. It really is. <laughs> Star Trek 4. The Undiscovered Country. I believe that's the one where they go home to Earth, isn't it? Is, no, well, no. Is, no, that's not the whale one. No, four is the one where uh, they go to meet God, who wants their ship. I need to watch these movies. You've you've never seen them? No. Oh no, well, I've only I've only watched uh, the original series. Okay, I've never watched Next Generation. Yeah. What I heard the Next Generation is like the one. Yeah, by people of our generation. Your generation. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like the one. It's not the one. Oh, well, it's not going to be better than Battlestar Galactica. No, it's not. It's not even fracking close. <laughs> uh, okay, at the MTV Movie Awards, best female performance went to Sharon Stone for Basic Instinct. Oh, girl. She beat out Demi Moore for A Few Good Men, Gina Davis, A League of Their Own, Whoopi Goldberg for Sister Act, which is pretty impressive, and Whitney Houston, Houston. for The Bodyguard. Yeah. Way to go, Sharon. I know. Best male performance went to Denzel Washington, though. Michael Douglas, Sarah, you were too old for this category. I'm sorry. You're not a good fucking actor in this movie. No. Uh, best movie went to A Few Good Men instead of Basic Instinct, which I agree with. I, a Few I'm Good Men is amazing. I'm surprised didn't get it. Uh, yeah. Best on-screen duo went to Mel Gibson and Danny Glover in Lethal Weapon 3 over Michael and Sharon in yeah, Basic well, Instinct. well, maybe they should have put Michael Douglas in Gus. But I'll be honest with you. I look at this list, I know who should have won. Woody Harrelson, Wesley Snipes, White Man Can't Jump. Oh, my God, yeah. Best villain went to Jennifer Jason Lee for single white female over Sharon Stone. Yeah. Bullshit. Uh, single white female, and I don't, we fucking need the devil. And most desirable female went to Sharon Stone, Basic Instinct. What is that movie? Over Madonna for Body of Evidence. Hey. Who many say is a Basic Instinct clone. <laughs> I don't want to watch that. Oh, and Kim Basinger... Kim Basinger, I bet she turned down Basic Instinct for Cool World because she was nominated for Cool World. Oh, that's <laughs> probably what happened. <laughs> Boy, was that a mistake. She she said, I don't want to be Catherine Trammell. I want to be Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, the Razzie Awards. Worst actor. Lost to Sylvester Stallone. Michael Douglas lost to Sylvester Stallone. See, how can you be in best actor category when you were in the Razzies for worst? I don't know. Uh, worst new star. Polly Shore wins for Encino Man over Sharon Stone's tribute to Theodore Cleaver in Basic Instinct. He's the Joes. And worst supporting actress. Jeannie Triplehorn was nominated, but Estelle Getty, Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, won. I didn't think <laughs> Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. Uh, I didn't think Jeannie Triplehorn was that bad. She just, her character was horrible. I have a feeling, like you look at the, the fact that it was nominated for Golden Globes, Oscars, and Razzies tells you that people didn't really know what to think of this movie. Yeah. Yeah, fair point. Uh, okay. On to the next segment titled Top 3, Bottom 3. This is where we talk about the three things we want to highlight in this movie. Then we talk about the three, three, three things that are bad, unforgivable, or downright travesties. We'll start with the top three. I will start. I love the music. Jerry Goldsmith composed a really haunting, seductive theme that matches every moment that is on the screen, including the final shot with the ice pick when that music just like hits a all-time high. Mm. My number two 
Gus. Every time Gus is on the screen, he's always entertaining. Plus, he's a really well-written audience point of view. Yeah. And my number one, I mean, <laughs> Sharon Stone. She, yeah. she's, she is very much the straw that stirs the drink here. If her performance wasn't so strong, she'd just be another pretty face. But as a femme fatale, there are few that are better represented in movies in movie history. Sam, what are your top three? Sharon Stone. <laughs> Sharon Stone. <laughs> and Sharon Stone. Uh, Thank you, sir. May I have another? <laughs> <laughs> please. Please, please, please. Wake up, Daddy Stone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really enjoyed the ice pick ending. Um, this movie honestly kind of sucked until that ending because it was out of nowhere. Yes. But you knew something was going to happen. You're like, oh, shit, she is the killer. Oh, my God. What? <laughs> um, sexy noir feels good. Mm. It does. It does. As a man, it, it feels good. But I don't think it did very well. But I think sexy noir feels good. Because I've never seen another porn like this. <laughs> it, kept, it kept me engaged the entire time. Have you seen my Lena? <laughs> <laughs> and number one it it truly is sharon stone yeah her performance even with some atrocious writing is absolutely unreal uh she does few things that act, act actors can do with characters like that yeah um it was unbelievable and an absolute pleasure the pleasure was all mine it's this performance. It's weird to think that this movie produced such a high quality character in such a shit movie. <laughs> oh my god, it's such a sleazy movie. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, okay, bottom three, time to vent. My number three, the Hazel Dobkin storyline. It adds a layer, but it's not really a necessary layer because Roxy already covers the hangs with murders deal. Deal. Yeah, you're like, oh, okay, she murdered people just out of jealousy. Oh, okay, this is the type of crowd you hang out with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the number two, the dialogue at times is so brutal. I can't tell whether it's bad writing or bad acting. And my number one, Nick Curran should have never been put on the case. Dumbest detective ever. Everybody gives him all the clues, but his dick is clearly in charge. <laughs> He's a detective. He's, He's a, a dick. dick. He's a dick. There it is. Yeah. All right, Sam, what are your bottom three? Uh, number three, it's the poor writing and just the really cheesy, awkward moments. This is just, this is a movie that, <laughs> got Oscar nominations for being a porno. It has porn, it has porn writing. It has porn acting. It's horrible. Number two, leading into that. Why the fuck is Michael Douglas here? I don't, I, I don't, know. I don't, he's not, sorry. He's not a sexy man. Nope. He's not any type of like, oh yeah, he's a good looking detective that she'd want to get in bed with and like manipulate and ruin his life. This is just like some fucking loser 47 year old Your detective. Balls are showing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and my number one, honestly, it's too sexual. It's too sexual. Yeah. There's a line and <laughs> the line is <laughs> gone. Uh, it, hey, you get your damn hands off her. <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying not to sound like a square, but if you've seen this movie, you know, it just crosses a line to, it just feels like you're watching a softcore porn acting and fucking kids today. So desensitized by movies and television. <laughs> okay. Well, we use an A to F scale here on the movie planet. C is average. A is the highest. F is the lowest. If it gets all Fs, goes the global killer. Question is, what do you give 1992's Basic Instinct in the mystery thriller movie genre by today's standards? I'll let you go first since I nominated it. Okay. Go for it. I went into this movie thinking it's so famous and the name alone, it still gets thrown around because it's a great movie and because it has not only a provocative interrogation scene, but a very well shot and done scene. <laughs> like a master craft of a scene. Yes. Well, it's got the interrogation scene, but boy, did it miss out on the great. <laughs> Halfway through, I was bored by the stupidity of Nick 
and everyone surrounding him. You're not allowed to sleep with your suspects. She's clearly playing him and she's just, it's, she's clearly, she's clearly playing with her food and I get it. This man has no self-awareness and it kills me. Gus is the only logical voice here and half the time he's drunk. <laughs> Sharon Stone's performance is the saving grace of this movie, even if I was uncomfortable watching half, if not all of her sex scenes. Some of her lines were incredibly cheesily 80s porn material. But that being said, she is the alpha. She is the lion in the den. She is the reason for the song Man Eater. She owns the role. She saves the movie. And I love this character more than I probably should. <laughs> the score is wit written really well and adds atmosphere intelligently when the character's choices are not. <laughs> I felt that the death of Beth was forced and for a smart woman, for a smart psychologist in front of a panicking man with a gun would have handled the situation much differently. Nick, you're a fucking moron. <laughs> and a sleaze. If C is average, then this movie is below average. This movie is a C minus. I probably wouldn't watch this again for any other reason than C Catherine. That is a very fair review. Thank I, you. I can't argue with anything that you said in there at all. Thank you. Yeah. Except you're great. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, well, Paul Verhoeven, you've shown up again on the movie planet. First with RoboCop, a movie that made over-the-top violence and bureaucratic politics an easy-to-watch adventure. Now with Basic Instinct, a movie that made over-the-top sex and bureaucratic politics an easy-watch to rem uh, adventure. So long as your parents are not watching it with you. <laughs> Look, we know what kind of director Paul is. The question is, can he make a Pantheon-worthy film? Well, of his credits, which include RoboCop, Total Recall, Basic Instinct, Showgirls. I didn't know he did Showgirls. Starship Troopers and Hollow Man. I'd say that the only two of these movies will have no shot. What Showgirls a and Hollow Man. Roller coaster. <laughs> From 1987 to 2000, those were the only six movies he made, which is pretty impressive. But some could argue that Basic Instinct is the best and most cohesive story of the lot. The star of this movie isn't exactly the dialogue, but it's how the dialogue is shot. Writer Joe Esterhaus does a great job of introducing a new element to the plot that can always be interpreted in two ways. This keeps the audience guessing. Yes, we are 99% sure that Catherine did the crime, but are we 100% sure? No. There's always that reasonable doubt that's thrown in to make you wonder if it's not her, then whomever it is, that makes sense. He also paces this movie pretty well. This movie's a brief two hours and seven minutes, from intro credits to end credits. But let's be clear, I'm not giving, gonna give Joe Westerhouse all the credit for the pacing, maybe just 40% of the credit. The other 60% goes to the actors. The whole ensemble is very easy to watch. I'm not saying it's a good acting crew, but they're easy to watch. Michael Douglas, who was 48 at the time, no matter what he does, is a movie star. He's easily watchable. He doesn't have much of a range, but he's not asked to do a whole lot in this movie other than act manic, confused, playful, and paranoid. The rest of the police involved are your typical 90s ensemble of a police department, and they appear to have very good chemistry with each other. In fact, before Catherine shows up on the scene, it appears to be a good group or cop drama. Enter Sharon Stone, who was 34 at this time. This woman is the Helen of Troy of this movie. She enters the fray and libidos go crazy. And let's be clear, she earns that type of reputation. Her delivery 90% of the time is oozing with seduction. It's clear she's always playing a game because she speaks in nothing both uh, in, in nothing but confidential information in double entendres, and she's incredibly easy on the eyes. She is, for the purpose of any future reviews, the gold standard, the bar by which any femme fatales can be measured against from 1992 and onward. When she's alone with Nick in any scene, I worry for the safety of Nick. It's like watching a moth in a flame. That moth is going to die because of stupidity. Finally, the music in this movie plays so well... It's a simple soundtrack that crescendos at the right times, enters in a way to signal to the audience that something isn't right, and enhances what may be otherwise boring scenes like the car chases. I see why Jerry Goldsmith is one of the greats in cinema. I can't hear this soundtrack without seeing specific scenes in my head, and it is spooky as hell. But here we are today, looking at this movie from 1992, and there are a lot of problems here. Number one, the dialogue is too clunky. Number two, Michael Douglas is way too old to be playing this character. In fact, I'd almost wish that they'd gotten someone younger than Sharon Stone. But maybe that's the point. 
a naive cop would have been much easier to manipulate than a veteran one. Who knows? The only time we learn about number three, the only time we learn about characters like Roxy or Hazel is through police dossiers, which doesn't tell you about the person, just the credits. Number four, the main sex scene runs a little long, but I can't knock it completely because I can understand why he did it that long. And my number five, Nick Curran doesn't make any smart choices at all through this movie, which is wholly unbelievable. But as you've heard us talk about this, we both agree we'd be making the exact same fucking decisions. Everyone around him is trying to help him, and he's in full denial because he's thinking with Captain Winky instead of his brain. Overall, as far as Paul Verhoeven movies go, this is near legendary. But, you know, that, that's not saying a whole lot. Where it sits in cinematic history is unparalleled. Heck, it gave way to countless softcore shows on Skinamax, or at least made us notice them. But by today's standards, there are better mysteries, but I can't think of too many erotic thrillers that are as good. So I'm giving this a solid B minus. One of the best mainstream erotic thriller mysteries with some slightly below average hiccups. So B minus and a C minus. B minus, bold. Well, it... But, well, no, I understand. A B, is, I understand a B minus for erotic thrillers, but we're not in erotic thrillers. Well, it's mystery and thrillers, and erotic thrillers are a part of the thriller part. Okay. Yeah, no, no, no. It's yeah. fine. And and honestly, I I will say this: I will claim that this is an above average one because even until the end, it had you guessing who the killer was, all the way to the end. And a below average one, you can tell who it is right away. Mm. That's why I say that. That's that's my my interpretation. Yeah. So let's see. And it was a B and I knocked it down to B minus. Okay. So I'm going to grade this out here. That's an eight now. And that makes this. Ooh, no A's in this pantheon. Well, one of them should be an A. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're so right, the prestige should be uh, the usual suspects. No, absolutely. Um, Why, who graded that? This movie, Basic Instinct, gets a 6.5 out of 12, which is a C average. It is average which okay. oh, yeah. i'm okay with that i i i can live with that would i want it higher of course i would but i can <laughs> live with it now who gave let's see the usual suspects that was uh, did that with you okay so i gave it a perfect score jc and joel both gave it a b plus what the fuck is wrong with them yeah well Hey, if you'd like to give it a grade, you can. <laughs> yeah, give it an A plus. That's one of the <laughs> greatest. No, it's an A plus. I give it a That's twelve a right perfect there. Perfect score. Okay, so a twelve. So that bumps up to an A minus. Great. Okay, it's an A it's minus, an a. everybody. At least it's an A. It's an A minus, and it's in the it's it's okay. It's a little bit higher now, which is nice. Feels good. Oh, feels so good. <laughs> yes, we need to get phew, need to get knives out on there. Oh, I agree. We need to get. Freaking seven up there. Seven be perfect for that. Mulholland Drive. What else do I got? I have nothing else underneath that. So yeah, we gotta get all those in there. Yeah. Um. Okay. So revisiting the list of movies in the Pantheon. Number one is The Usual Suspects with an A minus. Now, uh, number two, The Prestige with a B plus. Number three, The Go uh, is Gone Girl with a. Uh, this movie should have been above Gone Girl. Okay, and then number four with a C. Basic instinct, but hey, you're in the pantheon. You'll be there for a while. Uh, good pantheon. It's a pretty good. I could watch all four of those movies and be fine. Yeah. Uh, let's get the critic stats off. Do you love this movie? Like this movie? Or none of the above? I love this movie. Wow. Okay. I love this movie because, and I have actually tried this before. If you cut out all the sex scenes except for the first one, this movie still works. Not allowed to do that. <laughs> it, then it still works. Still works. It still works. Still it's not just to do it. a little bit, a lo little bit longer, <laughs> a little bit longer. That's all. Sam, what about you? I like it. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that I might... was bored halfway. It was about a half an hour too long. Yeah. Uh, it's just it was so clunky and poorly written at times. It's just like God, kill me, get me out of here. You a pro? And then no, I'm an amateur. I'm an amateur. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I'm back in it, baby. So was the writing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's all we got time for today, Movie Planeteers. Next show, we'll look at Carrie 
from 1976 for the Horror Pantheon. This was a user request. Nice. Yes. You can email the Movie Planet using the address movieplanetpodcast at gmail.com. If you enjoyed the show, subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or Podbean. Give us a four or five star review. Like us on Facebook, Twitter, and follow our Instagram. The opinions expressed on the Movie Planet Podcast are those of our, well, it's our own fucking opinion. The Movie Planet Podcast is not affiliated with, prepared for, approved, or licensed by any entity that created any films discussed or reviewed herein. All movie clips and music included in the podcast are the intellectual property of the respective copyright holders. They are included here for the purpose of review and no infringement is intended. Sam! Any last word? Yeah, I got a little uh, service announcement for the PSA for the, for the little PSA for the men out there. Be the Gus. <laughs> be the Gus. Don't be the Nick. Be smart out there, guys. I like that. I remember how you used to hold me. How I used to sit on your face and wriggle. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening and happy movie watching. <laughs> Bye. Did you order this pepperoni pizza with sausage? <laughs> Why, yes, but I left all my money in my other wallet, which is in my husband's car. Oh, well. And I don't have a way to pay you. Is there something we can work out? I don't know. My boss usually frowns on me staying for a long time at, a, at someone's house. It won't be long. Zip. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Okay.